Let's go ahead and open. If everyone can just mute their mics, we'll go ahead and get started. We'll open in a word of prayer. And uh, thank you for joining session number three. Hopefully we'll have more, although I think some will be attending, uh, watching the video delayed. So that's fine. Anyway, um, there's a smaller audience tonight, so please feel free to ask your questions. I really want to emphasize to ask your questions if you can. And uh, let's go ahead and begin in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for tonight. and We just give you glory and, and honor and praise. We thank you for the internet. We thank you for the power. May you keep it on this whole time as we discuss. Father God, we ask for your guidance and strength that you would lead us through this time as we start to begin to really apply the method to, to, to the text and also finish the, the history of interpretation. Father God, may we learn from the mistakes of the past and may we uh, seek to, to apply the, the method in humility and that you would just use this time uh, for your glory and honor. We give, it, we give it to you. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. Okay, thank you all for joining tonight, and uh, we do have a, a, a couple less people. Let me just go through here, but it's fine. Some people will be joining later, and then others will watch it delayed, and um, let's go ahead and begin the PowerPoint. So this is TH502, TH100 hermeneutics, and this is our third session. We will start the process tonight. So we my prayer and desire is to, to begin to uh, bring, bring you into the process. Some people will spend a lot of time just talking through abstract, which is good, which is really good and necessary. But I do want to kind of include, I guess our, my desire for, for our class is to have a section of lecture where, where we're learning some, some facts about history, about the method. But then there's half of the lecture is also is applying the method. So, so th those things are very important, applying the method, because that's why we're here. If, if, we're, if we're only here for the knowledge and not for applying the method, what are we doing? And then the other thing too is that, is that you can't really, really begin to assess and to understand the contextual issues, the history of interpretation issues, until you become very good at the method. The better you become in the method, the more you can apply, the better that that you'll be able to really see and to um, understand who's right, who's wrong. I agree with this. I disagree with that. And so really, as we move along, we're really tracking on two. There's two methods as we track along. Number one, applying the method. And then the other half of the lecture will be, of course, giving you some of the background, giving you more information, dealing with the theoretical. So we're, it's almost like math class. There's the theoretical part, and then there's the application part. So, so that's the goal. So let, let's go ahead and let's just do a brief overview for tonight. So these are the goals for tonight. So Lord willing, we'll, we'll get to them. Uh, we, want, we do wanna go over questions from the homework. So I wanna answer any of your questions, any of your issues in dealing with, um, in dealing with your, your assignments, maybe you have questions on formatting. So I do want to, I do want to answer your questions. Uh, and then secondly, I want to finish the history of interpretation. And so we will finish the PowerPoint from last week. And then that will be the extent of our, of there's reading for, let me just take a step back with the questions for the homework. Uh, we'll also include those who read for, for the TH 502. So if you read, you can ask questions about the reading. We will have a dis we will push that discussion back to next week, just because I think there's a lot of information already. I don't want to stress over stress you, uh, stress you out. I am thinking about for the reading maybe having a separate one hour discussion maybe on Saturday like we did last week and we can record it. I'm just thinking about those things. I don't want to give you too much information. We do need to finish the history of interpretation, and the reason why we're not going to have. Uh, my highlights from the reading for tonight is just because we're starting to apply the method on Romans 1, 16 and 17. So I want that to be really um, our focus tonight. And then, um, yeah, and so, yeah, the highlights of the reading we, we probably will not get to tonight. Um, but we, we can discuss. So, so if there's time at the end, we'll discuss 
your reading, you have questions, and then and then we can um, either we'll do it next week or I'll have a second a separate session for those who want to interact a lot more with the reading. Um, so I hope that's making sense. I just I don't want to I, I, I want I don't want to, to to have too much information be rushed through and then people are left behind uh, on the side of the road <laughs> trying to breathe and we're already running up the mountains. I don't want to do that. So we'll see what happens here. Okay, and then lastly, of course, assign the new homework. So that that's really that's the 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 roadmap for tonight. And so just questions from the homework. What are your questions from the homework? I have not been able to look. I've only graded a couple of the homework assignments. What are your questions? What are your struggles in look using theology on the web, using the cloud resource uh, uh, tool? What are your questions from the homework? Does anyone have any questions from the homework? Let's just take let's just take maybe five to ten minutes. Go ahead and ask your questions. Mine was I was not sure whether uh, I will download it for you or I will download it for myself only. That was okay. okay. First, I was confused yeah. of that. That's why I asked you through email. No, great, great question. So I'll just repeat the question so everyone has because that was a great question. Uh, I think some people. Sometimes I explain my method, the method to my madness, and sometimes I don't. So the, the purpose for the download is for your benefit. I want you to download the commentaries and the journal articles so that you can use them at your leisure. If you lose internet, you still have access to them. It's for your research and for your, your paper. I, I, want to know, I want to know the title of the commentary and the author and um, or the journal article title and the author. I am going to add in the future the the the, the journal article, the journal itself, because you know I trust you. I'm not I'm not questioning whether you download it or not. But my, the reason for that is I can give you feedback. I can say, and some of you've already seen my feedback. Oh, this is a really good article. Spend your time here. Um, oh, this is a little more liberal. Uh, be careful. In this reading, um, or 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 yeah, this reading's basic. Use it in application, but you still need to get more technical. So, really, the, the benefit of just giving me the name, I want the name clearly, uh, the title, the the title or the name, and then the author is I can re react really quick. I think one one or two people that I again I didn't see everyone's. Someone was putting the uh, the the. They were copying and pasting the, the hyperlink, which is great, but, but I don't really need that because I'm not going, you know, I trust you. And, and it is hard for me to see if you just send me the hyperlink or the link from the, the, the web link, it's hard for me to see, okay, what's the, what's the name of the commentary and who's the author? I can't really tell that. So again, um, just to really kind of, I'm, I'm going long on the point, but just to really help give you the method as to what I'm looking for. So just the name, the author, and then if it's a journal article moving forward, and I'll specify that in the homework, I want the, the name of the journal because not all journals, not all commentaries are created equal. <laughs> so maybe that's my famous quote for research. Not all journals and not all uh, books are created equal. So we need to read with critical. Great, great question, Koya Boy, And I hope that clarifies, that clarifies for, for future assignments. Uh, Henry, go ahead. Okay. Um, What's the difference between journal and commentaries? Okay, great question. Okay, so a, a, a commentary is, is, is a, uh, a thorough explanation of any particular book or group of books. So it will typically go verse by verse, and it's a book. It's big, all right? Um, so you'll have a commentary on John, and, it, and it's going to go verse by verse or section by section. It will be the entire the entire book of John. And so commentaries are, are full books. A journal article is a much smaller, it's only probably between 10 to 20 pages. It's not a book, it's an article. And typically it, it has a very specific, so it's dealing with one verse, it's dealing with one concept in a book or in theology. And so the benefit of a journal, a journal imagine a journal article like a research paper. It's dealing with a specific uh, topic, it's dealing with a specific area, and it's really seeking that to answer that question. So the benefit is that, for example, a journal article can be used, um, and we'll see this later as we work through Romans 1, 16, 17, but 
I, I think I gave the example last time. Um, it'll answer, for example, it'll define the word righteousness of God, the phrase righteousness, righteousness of God in Romans. So it's dealing with the specific concept in the book of Romans. Or uh, another title will be like righteousness in the book of Matthew, in the gospel of Matthew. And so it's, it's very specific. So the benefit of the journal article, it's going to really give you a lot of good information. You can use journal articles. Looking at their footnotes, you'll see other notes, other resources that are good, and you can, it's giving you other, it's giving their research so that you can pursue that. The downside of a journal article is that unless you're really interacting or that's part of your text, there's no benefit. So, so downloading a journal article on Romans 3.21 and, and our text is Romans 1.16, no benefit, unless unless the two are parallel. If the two are parallel, absolutely. So yeah, so yeah, that's really the difference. Great question, great question. Um, good. So I, I do. I want us to practice. The, primarily, you'll be interacting with commentaries, but I want you to start becoming familiar with journal articles because there can be some massive reward in a journal article. Some some of the article the massive reward. Other times, it's it's hit or miss. It's really hit or miss. But there's there is some really good information in articles. Great. A any other questions or comments? Uh, one, one question uh, I had encountered, if I want to copy or download it to my file, there are, there are articles that are easy to download or to copy, but there are certain articles that are not be, there are certain questions they ask before they allow you to download. Uh, what is your uh, suggestion to this kind yeah. of? No, or journal. No, great, great comment. Um, the the theology on the web safe. Some some of the places is very safe. You just download; it's very easy. Other websites will require your information. Now they could require your information just for their website for data collection, or maybe there's a login. Um, and so for me, I'm very cautious. I'm very cautious where I'll give my personal information. Um, some will allow you just to read on the website and then you have to download, um, then you have to give information. So um, that's really your, assess your assessment and risk if you're giving your personal information. You could send me the website and I could say, hey, you know, maybe I would do it, but still it's your risk or, or, or not. Um, so that, 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 there is a gray area there. On Google, so I'll just do a parallel. Google Books, you cannot download. Um, Google, but, but, but the benefit of Google Books is that those books cost money, but you can still read sections. So I would recommend in areas where you can't download some other online open source libraries, you can't download. You can just read. It's just as if you walked into a library and you take the book off the shelf and you read. So uh, we had our first research workshop last week. We're going to do another one maybe this week or next week um, there is a need for you with some of these websites where you can't download you just read and then you need to take notes you need to take notes where you found your, your quotation you need to, to copy the quotation um, so just imagine some of these websites Koyabobo and others just imagine it as if you're walking into a library you can't take it out <laughs> so um, yeah. There is one I encountered that they asked for for me to subscribe to that journal. Uh, do you think we should do that? Okay, so that so subs that's fine. If if it's asking for a subscription, I mean, you will have to give your email, and they'll probably send other information to you. But I'm subscribed. I'm subscribed to several. I'm subscribed to a journal for leadership. I'm subscribed to the Southern Baptist, and they'll send me when they post a new article. They'll send me the email. So if it's an email, on lead, if it's a journal on leadership, so it, yeah, I would, again, um, if it's if it's, I would have to see the specific example. But if they're if they're off offering the subscription, yeah, they're they're looking to share the information. Just to summarize, if it's off for asking to subscribe and you like the journal article, the journal, the journal itself, then yeah, I, it's it's safe. It's safe. It should be safe. Um, but again, it's your risk. Um, I assume no liability if something happens. Uh, yeah, so you can send me an email with a specific example and I can again give my, my take on it. So anyone else, any other questions? Great questions, really good questions. Anyone else? Uh, Pastor Tim? Yes. 
Yes, uh, actually, what I did with my homework, I did not, uh, because I thought when I, I pressed the download, the PDF, yeah. it would automatically download in my laptop, but it didn't, but I skimmed through the articles. Is it yeah. acceptable? I mean, for the yeah, homework. So, I, yeah, so if, if you can't, if there's some reason why you can't download, um, maybe I'll change the requirement. As long as you 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 look at the article or you save the link so you can go back, that's acceptable. Maybe I'll say download or save the link, the, the link so that you can access. The, again, the spirit of the assignment is to is to get you interacting and finding these resources and then having access. So yeah, let me make a change. If, if you if you're saving the link, you can bookmark it, right? You can bookmark links. Yes. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. So, so as long as you have access to, to those resources, that, that, that's fine. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. No, you're welcome. And I'll make that, let, let me make a note here. I'll make that change because that is some journal you can't, you can't download. It's just, you can view. So, um, uh, uh, Pastor Tim. Yes. Uh, I noticed, okay. When I was playing around with this, uh, <clears throat> With this, what is this? Gloa uh, Cloud. Yeah. yeah. Resource. Tool. In resource, you know, the Christian Classic Etheral Library yeah. and uh, Theology on Web. It's just they're they're intertwined. Yeah. They're linked together. Yeah. So, so no great observation. So the way we're, Theology on the Web is both it has resources and then it's almost functioning like the cloud resource tool. It's connecting you to other places to get those resources because sometimes he he's trying to post it on his website, but some copyright says, no, you can't post, just link our, net, our website. So for example, the Southern Baptist Theological Journal, he can't store the, the, the journal articles on his website. He can only link to, to the other website. So that's a great observation, Henry. And um, yeah, you'll find that as well some of the websites will be intertwined. That is an excellent observation. Yep, that is correct. Same uh, same observation from when I started to look into that Step Bible website. Yeah. It leads you to so many journals. My goodness, I don't know which to want to choose. So I have to make uh, one <laughs> important choice. So I, ha I, have, I have to choose the more familiar, like the Baptist Journal. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what's the other one. I tried, but it leads me to several more journals, yeah. and I don't know which one to choose. So it takes a lot of time. So doing yeah. that, I don't know if you can, uh, if you have some way somehow to shortcut the procedure or the process, so we can easily look for the appropriate uh, link from uh, Step Bible to whatever is the next link. Yeah. So, so my plan eventually is to offer. Uh, specific so for example telling you which which journal are which journals are much better which are have limited value um, so so I hope in the future to have that also for you some of it is uh, some of it is <laughs> running yourself so so um, yeah <laughs> so maybe in the future that is true pastor that is true <laughs> Uh, I'll, personal testimony. I've started. I started doing this for my own, 2014, 15, and it's a process for me. So, um, I do want to make it easier for you. At the same time, sometimes it's the more you're, you're, you really you become familiar yourself. This will become easier over time. So, so I, I know right now it's a lot of time, but. Um, it will become easier over time. It, 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 it will, I promise. And uh, uh, so there's hope. W one other thing I'm thinking about doing is I think I'm going to set up an office hour just like in a, in a, in a school, you'll have a teacher will have an office hour. And so I'll set up an office hour maybe from like on Thursday, one to three, where you can, or, or maybe, yeah, maybe Thursday. I'm still thinking about the time, but you can just send me like your questions during that time and I can help you in your research. So you can message me and we can, and we can do some of this together. Just like an office hour, just as if we were at a school and you walked into my office and you're asking me for help. So, 
let me check my schedule and consult with my wife. <laughs> so, because some of you are emailing me, and it's fine. Don't ever feel that if you're messaging, you can message me anytime, okay? Um, I will try to answer you, but I can't promise. So again, the caveat is you can message me at 10 or 11 p.m. Maybe I will answer you. Maybe I won't. <laughs> Maybe I'll see your message and you'll see that I see it. And I'm like, I'm going to bed. <laughs> so, so, yeah, don't feel, don't be offended. Um, don't, don't worry. Um, my wife, some, one time I was answering from Henry and my wife's like, go to bed. Tim. She was hitting me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so. Maybe we'll have an office hour, but I really hope this is a journey for all of us. And so as well for you, there needs to be a time where you take a break. And um, yeah, so th this is good though. This is good. Anyone else, anyone else have a question or, or, a, or a comment before we go on? Last question from me. Last go question. ahead, go ahead. Uh, since the, the end of our, uh, the goal of our class hermeneutics is we can be able to prepare a sermon coming uh, from the verse which we have sent. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yes. And we go directly to the cloud resources, to the, to the, to the Bible study, then to the sermon. You're saying, to, uh, to, I, I'm confused. You're, you're saying. Okay. In, there is in that cloud uh that the cloud software uh there is sermons oh okay yeah okay no that's really good all right so yeah so I, i'm going to no that's a great that's a great caveat i actually did not think about that yes i do not want you to this is very important this should be your own work i don't want you going to other sermons and and, and copying or listening and copying uh, you can listen to any other sermon you want. Shortcut. Yeah, no shortcuts. Talaga, no shortcuts. Uh, shortcut in the yeah, no, that's it. I did not even think about that. <laughs> so, and I don't, I don't think anyone would do it intentionally. But just because the other thing too, even when you're when you're pre when you're preparing your sermon, you don't want to listen to other ser uh, other preachers because you're even short you're even shortcutting you're even shortcutting that interpretation process where the spirit is leading you through the text. So, um, so now I understand some people are not there yet. And so they're, they're, they're following a pattern. Fair enough. But ideally our goal as leaders of and, and expositors of the word, we get to a place where we can consult commentaries. We can, we can research, but when it comes to the final sermons, um, putting that after or putting that, trying to remove, so we're not influenced. Um, yeah, that's a great caveat, Pastor Henry. And so let's, let's, I'm going to require that. You can't listen to any sermons on your text. That, that is a requirement. It's been said. So even if it's not written, you've heard it, it will be on the, on the, on the YouTube. So your text, you cannot listen to any sermons. Okay. Um, yeah. Now here's a caveat though. There are some commentaries that will have sermon outlines they'll have and that's fine that's part of the research process okay but listening to a final sermon downloading a, a the, the manuscript of a final sermon that's not allowed you can't do that yep great 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 anyone else last call last call for any other questions for the homework the the reading we'll discuss at the end of uh, at, at end of class uh sir King. yes go ahead who is this uh, are, are we, uh, Sunny, are we allowed to use, uh, required to use uh, Calvin's commentary? Wait, uh, can you repeat your question? Uh, can, uh, is Calvin's commentary a required uh, for our resources? Yeah, so it's required. Yeah, I want it to be required unless, actually someone was saying there's only one, there's only one book that Calvin did not write a commentary on and that is and that is a uh, revelation. <laughs> so he wrote over every other book except revelation. But um, if you have five other commentaries that are technical and, and, and really good, that's fine. The reason why I, I'm requiring Calvin is because um, with the free resources, the downloads, some places it's hard to find. 
So if you, if you find five other really good commentaries you prefer not to use Calvin, that's fine. Um, but I, but I would like, I would like to, cons again, just because he, he has a lot of good things to say and it's, and it's a free resource. And, and my thinking was, you know, um, it, for some books of the Bible, finding five might be hard. So if you can find five, they're good. You send me the information and that's fine. But if you can't, that's, that's the thinking behind requiring Calvin. Yeah. Okay, sir. See, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. And again, I want to repeat, if you have a physical book, um, now for the assignment, you have to download, that was due today, you have to download or, or hyperlink five. But in your paper, if you have a book or another commentary, that's fine. You, you don't have to use the five that you download. You should, you should be consulting them, but you, I'm not going to require you to, to use them. If you have other books, that, 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 you, everything is acceptable. Everything that's scholarly is acceptable. Um, uh, we'll discuss more about um, those that I don't want, very applicational, um, basic or like Bible studies. I, I don't really want to be used, but yeah. Good. Anyone else? Any other questions? I think that's it. Okay, I'm looking through here. Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, I hope that the assignment that was due tonight was helpful. And, you know, I, I, I resonate with what Kuya Boboy was saying, that it, it is hard looking through all this stuff and then you're trying to assess. And I will say this. I've been there with you and I've experienced the same thing. I, and I know it's hard. And, and I do... I, I want to work with you as we go on this journey together. At the same time, there um, sometimes the best way to learn is just through experience. And so I do want you to experience the internet <laughs> um, in a good way. So, um, okay, let's go ahead on to um, highlight. Let's finish our PowerPoint on highlights from the history of interpretation. Uh, this is, I, I'm just going to quickly review from last week. We'll move on. And so this is still the reading from last week. So if you, if you finished the reading, if, if you were someone who read, who, who did some additional reading and you want to make a comment or ask a question, you can. Do not hesitate to interrupt me. And um, I hope that this, this can be a time of, of, of benefit. For, for a while, I just didn't see a great need for dealing with the history of interpretation, but I really have come back and just really see the value of looking, for us looking back at history and seeing how the scripture was interpreted, we see that we're doing the same process, the same method as has been done for thousands of years. And there has been some bad that we need to not follow. And there's been a lot of good. And, and number one, I, I, um, just the, the importance of having humility, the importance of doing something in line with tradition, not just because it's tradition, but because the spirit works the same way. And so if he's been working through a, a, a particular hermeneutical method, we should be very, uh, we should be very wise to, to really follow and consider and just not, you know, some people say, Oh, they did it all wrong. We're doing something new. We're going back to the first century church. And so I, I'm very hesitant with that type of mentality because then you're, you're essentially saying that, for 2,000 years, the Holy Spirit got it wrong. He just started getting it right now, and you are the, you are the key. And that's very that, – that, that, although we would not say that, that out loud, that can be very arrogant. So, um, uh, yeah, let's, let's continue on here. So this is the reading from Chapter 2 of History of Interpretation, Introduction to Biblical Hermeneutics. And uh, the three purposes he gave was just introducing key issues. So as we go through here, we're looking at key issues that continue to, 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 to crop up. And we'll, we'll, we'll answer them as the semester progresses. Also, we want to, to, we want you to be warned. So especially towards the end of this, this PowerPoint, we really want you to be warned as the, the, the op, both the opportunities, but also the, the dangers and the pitfalls. There are dangers and pitfalls for bad, um, uh, methods and uh, processes that you might not be aware of, and 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 we we just need to be aware of them. And then number three is that we need to have this idea of humility. Okay, so just big big uh, big framework here. We have we're going with the Jewish interpretation. We we looked at that last week. You have the apostolic period, and then you have the the patristic period, which is just just the church fathers. 
And then you have the Middle Ages and then the Reformation. The Reformation was really was really transformative, uh, bringing us back to a, a really solid interpretative method. And then we have the post-Reformation period, and then we have the modern period. And there's been, uh, there's a lot of danger in the modern period. So we need to be aware and we need to be on guard. And some of us might not realize, but but hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll see those things. Okay, so, um, just repeating this as a way of review is that writers and editors sought to revise, update, and amend uh, source text. So within scripture, within inter, inner biblical, inner biblical, or intra biblical allusion, you have uh, earlier texts being cited, being uh, worked uh, by later editors or later writers. So that those would be editors of the the Old Testament books of the canon, and then also pro prophets, prophets. Are interacting with the Pentateuch, uh, Psalm, Psalmists are interacting with the Pentateuch, and then of course you have uh, uh, the the editors and the writer of Chronicles, which is post-exilic. Post-exilic means it's after the return from exile that they're writing this. Uh, we did make a caveat here: the most complex is the reinterpretation of First Kings in in, in uh, First and Second Chronicles, and I and I want to say complementary. The most complex is the complement uh, the complementary uh, interpretation. So um, Kings was written early, and and so uh, it's almost as if it's almost as if you have different perspectives on the same event. So it's not that Kings is right, Chronicles is wrong. It's not that Chronicles is right and Kings is wrong. It's that it's offering complementary views on the history of of Israel, specifically in during during the the, um, the monarchy, both united and divided, and that of course is a high view, taking a high view of Scripture that is inspired. Okay, so then we have post biblical interpretation. So this is Jewish interpretation after the closing of the Old Testament canon. That is that is both after the close of the of the canon but before the New Testament, and it continues on parallel with the New Testament in, into the future. So once the New Testament comes, you have, you have the, the Jewish interpretation, and then you have the Christian interpretation, okay? So there are almost two schools of thought that run parallel once the, once the church is created in the first century. Um, uh, and so here you have this, this idea of uh, Ezra publicly reads the Mosaic law while the Levites explain. And so this is literally uh, what we, in many ways, what we do in our church, in our churches today. You have both the reading of scripture and then the explanation. So when we say exposit the word, exposit the word, preach the word, there, of course, there's a, a, an exhortatory nature, exhortatory nature, but there's also this exposit, explaining. Exposit literally is just explaining. It's, it's, a, it's a synonym. And so this is what we have here. And, and they're doing it in the common tongue, the, the, the Aramaic, because the crowds no longer, the Jewish people no longer speak their, their mother tongue, which is uh, Hebrew. Um, and then you have this, this is really brought into reality through the Targum. The Targum is, uh, in Hebrew means interpretation. And this is an, an Aramaic translation, a, a translation slash paraphrase. It's not just, uh, uh, it's, yeah, I guess you could say, or it's, it's more than a translation. So it's a translation paraphrase. It's, and it's, it's also a commentary because it's the paraphrase is a, offering a lot more information to further explain what the text is saying. And, and they're doing this with a high view of scripture. Um, and so we, we have this in today, the, co the commentary of today is this, is this, uh, this is a predecessor to the commentary of today. It's Aramaic translation or paraphrase. Are we saying, Tim, that translation is synonymous to paraphrasing the text or uh, uh, no. work? The... That's what I'm saying. So I, that's why I kind of changed it. Yeah, it, I don't think he's, because there is, there is, they are translating Hebrew to Aramaic but it's more than a translation because even when you say translation, 
what do you mean? There's different schools of thought within translation, okay? And, and so I do, I want to say it's, it's, it's more than a translation. It's, it's a translation and a commentary. So, um, yeah, translation or paraphrase. Translation is, is, is using in a more generic sense, not in a literal, what we would say, we're looking for a formal equivalence type translation. Does that make sense? Because uh, what I usually understand by translation is you, a particular word, let's say from Latin, you, tra you translate it to English or the equivalent of that word from Latin to English. To me, that is the clear meaning of translation. But when you paraphrase, it sorts of give the meaning of the word. That aside only from saying that the English word of this is that, you also give the meaning of that word. That is to me the paraphrasing. Is that your understanding also? Yeah, so, no, so, that, but, but, yeah, so, when we speak in, this is, this is, what, you're always going to say it's confusing. Um, yeah, so if I say, Henry, translate for me, he's going to give as literal as possible that makes sense from English to Tagalog or English to Warai Warai, diba? But, but here, so in the Targum, sometimes they just translate literal, and other times it's a paraphrase, and even many times it's more than, it's a paraphrase or it's a commentary. So it's more than a translation. So that's why I'm saying like the word translate here is not being used in, in, in your sense. It's being used in a very generic sense of, because in, in, in linguistics, translation can be, paraphrase is a form of translation in linguistics. It's, it's actually a form. We, we would say, ah, oh, really? But, but it is. So there's, there's like formal equivalent, there's literal, there's formal equivalence, there's dynamic equivalence, and there's also paraphrase. So those are different schools of thought within the, the category of translation from a, linguistic, from a linguistic perspective, okay? So what you're describing, that's why I'm saying if, if, if our definition is your definition, which I'm fine with, we shouldn't be using the word translation here, okay? This word should not be used here. But... In, in the linguistic world, it's appropriate because it's, it's because you have paraphrase within that whole, yeah, it's, it's a little confusing. But it's, it, the big takeaway, Kuya Bobo, is that it's more than just a literal translation. It's more than that. But I, 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 I do want to emphasize that, that the Targum is, for, for, for our purposes, it's a commentary. They're explaining, they're expositing the text. And so there are those in the modern church that would say we shouldn't have expositing. We should just have maybe very basic Bible study. We should just have prayer, scripture reading, and the Lord's Supper. They're against any form of ex exposition of the text. And what, what I just want to draw attention to is that this, is, this has been a practice both of the Christian church and also of the Jewish communities that are, that are trying to faithfully follow the Word of God. So again, this is not black and white dogma, but it's a, it's a practice that has been going for a very long time. So for us just to throw it out, you have to have some really strong reasoning, you know, and, and especially in the context of, of the New Testament where, where Paul commands the teaching, the expositing of the word. So again, this will be, this will be further uh, validating Paul's commands. It will just be a, a further proof that, no, this is how it's always been. We need to have this style of, of, of books of, of of teaching in our church yeah good okay let, let, let's let, let's let's move on here so then we have we have uh hellenistic judaism hellenistic judaism and then we talked about this that this was developed in alexandria this is the lxx um uh the lxx is the septuagint or the greek translation of the pentateuch originally and then the rest of the old testament scripture was translated again i, I want to emphasize the LXX in the Pentateuch was a literal translation. It's used in the sense that Boboy said. It's a word for word. There's, there's a, a Hebrew word. It's translated in the, in the, in the Greek. Okay, so if you're uh, at Step Bible, you can look at an English form of the LXX, where it's translated not from Hebrew, but it's translated from the LXX, the Greek, into English. And, it, and it's helpful. It's helpful as, as we interpret it. It's a helpful tool for our, interpreta our interpretation of the Old Testament. But outside the Pentateuch, it, it, it transforms more into a, 
a paraphrased commentary. Sometimes it is literal translation. Many times it's a paraphrase, and, and also it could be a commentary. So again, there's benefit there as we're, as we're getting an interpretation that goes back thousands of thousands of years, but we have to be careful that it's not, it's not scripture. It, it, it's, it's an interpretation from fallible men. So it, it can be used in our interpretation method as how did they interpret this text? Let's say you're working in Psalm 1. You could look to the Greek uh, text and you could look to see how they translate it. Okay, that's how the Jewish understood it. Maybe that's how we should understand it. But it's not, it's not uh, inspired word of God. It, it is an interpretation from fallible humans. Okay, so there's limited benefit there. All right. In my research, in, in some of my studies, I would use the LXX. I would use it, recognizing that, that the potential. Um, okay. And then um, the big takeaway, though, is that after the interpret, after the uh, LXX, the Alexandrian school really this allegorical interpretation came on the on the on the the foreground for interpreting the, the true spiritual meaning lies behind the text so we're not focused on the literal words the literal words of the text we're trying to discover the meaning behind the text but with that being let me ask the question what could be the problem what do you see as a potential problem if we're looking at true spiritual meaning behind the text and not the words itself what's the danger someone answer the question for me what's the danger of, of that type of interpretation. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Sunny. To, to me, the, the danger uh, is, uh, the, uh, the, uh, is the... Okay, Queen Bobo, you go first, then Sunny. Go ahead. Yeah. The number one problem is why, why choose a person to give the spiritual meaning when that person is not even spiritual in the first place? So that's the, that's the one danger. <laughs> that's what I noticed when they, when they use the Hellenistic Judaism and using the principle of Plato, the, the, the philosophy of Plato was a very was the number one source of their interpretation. So I'm wondering why why use Plato's philosophy when Plato is not even uh, probably considered as spiritual or uh, did Plato believe in God or did Plato yeah. believe in the works of God? No, that's great. So so when you, what what Koya Bobo is saying is that. We're following the interpretation of a of a fallen man. How is he spirit? You know how what, what gives what's his authoritative ground? And I would agree. What's the authoritative ground? Great. Um. Um. Uh. Kuya Boboy. I mean, sorry, Kuya Sunny. Go ahead. Oh yeah. So um, first, um, I think the I think the basic danger is if we approach the text, uh, you know. To interpret it spiritually is to what what the postmodern trying to understand the text. I mean, um, it's it's more on subjectivism. Like I, I like this text to be this way. I like this text to be that way. And um, yeah, that's the problem of allegory. And then uh, it it would also a danger of wrong um, misinterpretation of the search of of what the text really says. Yeah. Uh, just like for example, you try to. You try to. Uh, this is this is the opposite of exegesis or eisegesis. Yeah. You try to put uh, something that is strange to the text or the strange to the mind of the author who wrote the text. For example, you uh, for God so loved the world, and then you try to, to interpret it in, in a different way in which which Jesus or John himself uh, conveys his reader to 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 understand. So yeah. this is this is actually the hermeneutical problems uh, going on out there. Uh, whether um, this is really a, what we call the reader response, which which you know Stein is trying to say, um, reader response is that the, te the text can only be meaningful if if we as a reader try to put a strange interpretation on the text instead of what that text really means yeah. to us. No, great, great, yeah. great. So so so. Sonny's making a, a, con a contemporary analogy with, with this. And, and the, the issue is, is that the, to kind of really just get down to the heart of what Sonny's saying, I think, and Sonny, correct me if I'm wrong, you're saying that there's no objectivity. It can be anything. 
right? I think that's what you're saying. It's, it's, it's purely yes. speculative. It's yes. whatever the spiritual person is saying. It's whatever is in your mind. And so there's, there's, no, there's yeah. no concrete way to validate. It's just whatever is in the person's mind. And then, that, and then that's the predecessor to the reader response where the reader response is whatever the reader, it's the reaction the reader has to the text. And in many ways, that's the same thing. In many ways, that's the same thing. Yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Hi, team. Yeah, Can I ahead. add, team? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, this is Alex. Hi, Alex. <laughs> uh, if I may quote John chapter 3, okay, when Jesus Christ was explaining things to Nicodemus, yeah. uh, Jesus was saying, I am telling you earthly things and you don't understand and how can I tell you about heavenly things yeah. you know what I'm trying to say so if we people who cannot understand the basic the things that we see here on earth and how much more we can understand about spiritual or heavenly things if we cannot literally understand like objectively understand what is written there and try to spiritualize it then that's the causes of the cults and all that we know right now we will be making a new religion so called religion if we will not really contextualize every text yeah no that's no that's really good and, that, and that's and and to just kind of just just bring bring your correct jesus was speaking to, to nicodemus's problem that he did he did not have the new birth and and that was preventing him from understanding the physical things if he can't understand the physical things how much more he can't understand the spiritual things so another right. yeah another component that alex is bringing out is this idea that in order for us to interpret, we have to have the regeneration of the spirit. That's another mm -hmm. component that's a part of this process here. And that goes back to Koya Boboy's comment about, about the, the person as well, right? About the, the spirituality of the person. Okay, um, because uh, regarding allegory, actually, I, I really like what um, Geiler of Kaiserberg observed, you, uh, the one that he said that, uh, the scripture has been made like a nose of wax. So it's like if if that would be the thing, it's like it will be interpreted whatever the reader would want it to be. Yeah. So that's why it's not reliable. Yeah, in that exactly, sense. exactly. And I think everyone's coming back to the, if, if we don't, if meaning does not remain in, in, in the, at the level of the words, it, it's pliable. You can say, make it say whatever you want. And, and I think that's what you're saying by the, the, the nose of wax, right? You can just, it's, you can change it to whatever you want. There's, there's no, there's no concrete, there's no objectivity to it. Great. I think, yes, I think yes. yeah, I think everyone's tracking here and great, great comments, great, great observations. I, I really appreciate that. Let, let's move on here. Um, so at least we really see the problem allegoric, allegorical interpretation is early and it's going to be a problem from from then on so it's in this in the in, in um uh, you'll see by the end of this this powerpoint that it's really a problem that continues on into the future uh just moving on here so uh we don't have a lot of time but um qumran community that this is the most likely the aseans and they they had this teacher of righteousness who had special divine inspiration so this sounds like a recipe for disaster <laughs> um the 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 teacher righteous had this special divine inspiration the focus of the qumran community is this idea of of they believe that they were in the last days and that the, the prophecies were being fulfilled in in their era in their time period and so they really they they focus on this this is that interpretation. So they would make direct connections with the text and the prophecy with specific events in, in their days. And so uh, you can imagine how this is, this is a, problematic, a, pro a problematic type interpretation where you have one teacher of righteousness that knows all. He has this special divine inspiration. And then they're making direct connections uh, that was their interpretation. So uh, for those who did the reading, they would even change the text to make it fit. They would modify the text. Uh, it, it's, really, it's really quite sad. Um, um, 
And so obviously the, the, the community is no more. Uh, can I ask one question? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Could, is it correct to say that uh, this cultic uh, principle is a product of this homegrown community thing? So I don't know if it's a product or it's just, it's just part of, what's the word? It's just, it's just necessary in when you have unbelievers involved in the church. Mean to say you always have them cropping up. They're always coming back. <laughs> so uh, not that there's a direct connection from Qumran to like the, the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witness or Iglesia. But that it's this is just a perennial problem. It keeps coming back. It's like termites. <laughs> they always come back. <laughs> There's different colonies. You kill one, another one comes. It's just, and and we we have Jesus teaches about, teaches about about false prophets and and later in Second Peter and Jude, they just keep coming back. And so, um, and that's actually uh, really Satan is behind that. The, the parable of the wheat and the tares in Matthew 13. I would highly recommend you read that on your own time. The, the enemy sows the tares among the wheat. Who has done this? Let's, let's root up the, the tares. And then the master of the house says, no, if you root up the, 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 the tares or destroy the wheat, let both grow together to the end of the age. And then there'll be a separation. And so part of the, 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 the continual coming in of the church, the, the false teachers, it's, it's it's the design of 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 the evil the evil one. He's done that, and so um, they just keep coming back. <laughs> but it's really true. Ecclesiastes says there's no new thing under the sun. Everything from before it's it, it is already. <laughs> so it's true. It's the same. So um, great question, Pastor Nick. Is uh, this rabbinic Judaism? Is this being uh, is this interpretation being applied or being used by the Jewish, the present Jewish? Yeah. So um, yeah. So this is going on into the present. You have you have this interpretation. It's all the way into the present. Yeah. Rabbinic Judaism is is something that's in the past. It's it's all the way into the present. So the, so this is still a school of interpretation that that is that is going on in the in, in the present as well. Great great question, Henry. Um, and so you have, you have this, uh, again, you don't have to know these. I'm just giving several, you have this, this halakha, which is rules to go by. You have Haggadah, which is the, a, a telling. So these are types of, of methods that they would use. Um, uh, and, and the big emphasis here is that they're following rabbinic tradition. So how the previous rabbis interpreted they will go with their interpretation. So this is really, you see this in the New Testament, especially in Jesus, uh, the, the, the traditions of the fathers. And so a big example of this is, is Matthew 15. Um, you violate the, the commandment of law. Your tradition violates the commandment of, of God. Uh, and, and so you really have this, again, they're, they're focused on following only the tradition and not actually looking at what the text says. Um, and then, of course, here you have the Midrash. So the Midrash is, this is very analogous. This is analogous to allegorical interpretation. This is uncovering deeper meanings behind the text. Okay, and so this is the same, uh, the same, the same style of this interpretation behind the text. And so we see that coming up. All right, so, so, so that's essentially, these are the major... Uh, the the Qumran community, the the Alexandrian school of Philo, and then the, the Jewish interpretation, rabbinic Jewish uh, Judaism. These are the major types of interpretation. And again, the benefit for us looking at these is seeing how some at times in the church we follow these things uh, unwittingly, and and sometimes um, and uh, and sometimes maybe maybe wittingly, maybe we know. <laughs> Maybe we are doing it. But again, the, the, the purpose is so that we can be aware and to be on guard. I will say this, that uncovering the deeper meanings behind the text, um, I come from a, my, my background. This is a problem in my background. Uh, not knowingly, functionally, there's a lot of spiritualizing of the text. So you have, especially in the Old Testament text, and there's just these totally different, inappropriate 
interpretations and applications because it's like this is this is very physical and I don't know what the spiritual truth is. I need to find some deeper meaning behind the text. And so uh, we do have these type of problems in the church, although people will not call people will not mention them. Uh, okay, so now we're into the church. So now the the Jesus has come, the Christ has come, he's died, he's resurrection. And so now we're in the apostolic the apostolic period. And so just moving quickly along here, how did the question that we want to ask is how did the apostles interpret the Old Testament? How did the apostles interpret the Old Testament? And they use uh, they interpret they looked at the Old Testament with literal fulfillment. So there was literal fulfillment. Jesus literally fulfilled the church. Literally fulfills some of the some of the prophetic set portions. Many of the prophetic portions. Um, uh, not to say there isn't a future yet. Uh, I should say not a future yet, but that there is there is prophetic fulfillment in the in the, in the church in the Messiah in the death resurrection and exaltation of the Messiah. Uh, uh, there's typological fulfillment. So this, this is really where you saw typology uh, discussed in some of the others. You'll see that later on in the, in, in, in the uh, early church. Typological fulfillment is, uh, we see this a lot in, in the book of Hebrews. It's a type is a physical picture or a physical event, a physical person. That is, that is analogous to a greater truth. So, for example, the classic example the, uh, is the, the lamb, the Old Testament Passover lamb. That is a type, according to John 1, of the greater Passover lamb. Behold the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Okay? So the, the, the Passover lamb is a type that, pro, that prophesies in its event, it prophesies of a greater of a greater type, namely Jesus Christ, the, 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 the one whose blood will take away the sins of the world, okay? And so you have many types throughout the Old Testament. And so the apostles saw the types, and they, they appropriately um, uh, declared them as such, as, 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 as prophetic. Um, some people are against this type of interpretation, but it's really necessary uh, especially later we'll see that Christ fulfills all, um, all scripture. So, uh, again, right now we're just, we're just highlighting. So you have literal fulfillment. You also have typological fulfillment. <clears throat> A third way is literal contextual interpretation and, um, uh, uh, literal contextual interpretation. So one of the strongest examples of this is, when uh, Paul quotes the, the, the Levitical command to not muzzle the ox, to not muzzle the ox when it's treading on on the grain, so the, the 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 command in the Old Testament was as the ox goes around and treads the grain, treads the um, and and uh, and grinds the 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 grain. Um, you couldn't put a muzzle; it, it had to eat. It had to eat as it worked. You couldn't muzzle it. it because it was doing the work. You had to let it eat as it as it went around and uh, um, grinded the grain. And so Paul uses that to command that that workers of the ministers of the gospel, teachers in, in the church, they could also take from the proceeds of the offerings. Okay, but that's that's it's taking Old Testament as a basis for for a New Testament command. Okay, now that gets into a lot of debate as far as the precise relationship with the Old Testament covenant, that gets into debate with how is that appropriate because the church is something different. We will not interact with that tonight. <laughs> um, all it is to say is that they were applying in a literal contextual interpretation of the Old Testament, and we should be doing that as well. Um, we should be doing that as well. There are those in the church that believe that the Old Testament has very little application in the church because it's two different programs. And um, the apostles did not view it like that, and, and neither should we. Not to say that there is a difference, not to say that there is a fulfillment and that there, there, is, there is something different, but it is to say that we need to be applying the Old Testament uh, in our church context. Um, and, then la and then fourthly, they had principal application. So they're also applying, applying the Old Testament in this principal application type. So... 
again, emphasizing the importance that we need to be uh, applying and interpreting the Old Testament scriptures. And um, I hope that we're all doing that. And so we'll, 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 we're going to work through, the, we're going to include that in our method as we work through. Any comments or questions through this? This is, this is basic, but perhaps we, we only thought that they're using literal fulfillment. Maybe this is new to you. Um, any questions or comments? So Tim, how can we determine from typological interpretation uh, with the... Uh, allegorical? Allegorical. Uh, and allegor yes, allegorical. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, no, great, yeah, great how question. How do we determine... Yeah. No, great question. So, so Sonny's question is, what is the difference between allegorical and typology? Okay, great question. Um, the, the, first, the first difference that we have to really recognize, I should, maybe before we, we talk differences, just fundamentally, um, typological is used by the apostles. So the, the, the strongest, I'll give the two strongest examples. Number one, the Lamb of God. So, so the, the Lamb of the Old Testament literally is is a type for the lamb the lamb um john the baptist says behold the lamb of god who has taken away the sins of the world so so typological is appropriate uh, the second really strong example is is john 3 as the serpent is raised in the wilderness so the son of man will be raised so clearly a relationship between the two there's a fulfillment between the two there is a a, a typological connection there um this serpent saved a few. This will save great. This was a physical salvation. This is a spiritual, eternal salvation between the two. So, so later we're going to really go into this, uh, um, or perhaps maybe an advanced hermeneutic. So we'll see. But so I, I first want to say that typological is appropriate. Um, but then the question Sonny's asking is, how do you differentiate between the two? So the number one way that we can differentiate between the two fundamentally is that intrinsic to the text so you do have the the, the divine author and the, and the human author so there are two authors but intrinsic to the text are, are, are clues okay there, there are, are strong clues that are suggesting this is a type okay um, we can look at the canonical context so how the apostles are looking at the Old Testament is is also a pattern as well so they're not they're not um, uh, with typology, it's not indiscriminate. Does that does that make sense? Mean to say they're coming up with all these different spiritual spiritualized. It's it's typically connected with the Christ and His Church. Okay, um, so there's a whole there's a whole um, process that we'll work through later. But 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 I I would say that there are clues even within the Old Testament context that suggest. That that certain events and 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 um, things are types. One the strong the, the I would say the strongest example is you have Exodus and exile. Everyone is familiar with Exodus and in, in um, Exodus one through fifteen. It's describing the, the the physical redemption of Israel from Egypt. Correct. Everyone's familiar with that. Well, the exile the exile is couched. In especially the prophets and, 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 and most notably Isaiah 40 to 66, the exile, which is uh, the exile, the Babylonian exile, and then return, it counts in New Exodus <laughs> terminology. So right there you have the Exodus, uh, the, the New Exodus in, in, in uh, Isaiah 40 to 66 is, is even like, connected with this first exodus in that same language i don't know if people are tracking me here so, but 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 that is so that's intrinsic in the old testament context um it's part of the old testament context and so there are a lot of different clues that we can go through later um, but i, I do want to say that there will be there will be strong clues both in the old testament with even with, it could be within the book even within the book itself but within the old testament canon that that are that are making these connections appropriate. It's not willy-nilly whatever you think. It, it, there are clear contextual clues, and anyone who's making a typological connection needs to look at the, the, the contextual clues. So, for example, in Isaiah 40 to 66, they're using the exact same language as the Exodus, preparing a way in the wilderness. <laughs> it's like preparing a, pre preparing a way in the Red Sea. It's the same. It's almost the same. So, um, uh, now, people will take this to an extreme, fair enough, 
and um, we need to be incredibly careful. But we will we will interact with this more. Um, but I do want to say that there is an appropriate place, very carefully. Okay, does that make sense, Sonny? Yes, yes, sir. Thank you so much. All right, no, and, and I appreciate that because we do need to we we do need to balance between the two. And some people are against typological, you know, because of the dangers. <laughs> um, but it, but I do want to emphasize that it's not pie in the sky. It's very specific. Some people will say only the typology that the apostles give us. Fair enough. Um, but we'll discuss that later. Okay, so so great. Um, let's move on here. Uh, let's go for another three or four minutes, and then we'll take our first break. Um, so during the patristic period, the, so after the, this is how this is how the apostles interpreted the scripture, and, and this is faithful. This is faithful to the text. They're 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 being led by the Holy Spirit. They're writing scripture, and then we get to the patristic period. The patristic period is the 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 you have the the apostolic fathers. Now these are these are after the apostles are gone. And they go back to allegorical interpretation. <laughs> they go right back to allegorical, allegorical interpretation. And we need to caveat, um, uh, there is confusion. When people read the Apostolic Fathers, some of it is typological interpretation. And, and, and uh, people are claiming that it's allegorical. Okay, so uh, there, you have to be very careful. Some Apostolic Fathers are using typological not allegorical. Okay, so so uh, you need to. Be, this is this is where it comes back to my caveat before with Alex that um, it's secondary sources. It's how they're reading the primary sources. They're reading it differently. Okay, but there is truth that many of them are going back to this allegorical. So there is a lot of allegorical interpretation, a lot of spiritual interpretation going on. Um, uh, and again, just really defining allegorical interpretation is the communication of meaning by assigning a non-literal meaning to elements or messages of the story. I do want to bring up one other point differentiating typological and allegorical. Allegorical is indiscriminately applying it across all of Scripture. Okay, you're, you're applying a spiritual meaning behind the text across all of Scripture. So Genesis, Isaiah, Psalms, Gospels. Uh, epistles, it, you, it, it's, a, it's, a interpret, it's an interpretative lens looking through all the scripture. Typology is really connected with the Old Testament type and then the, the New Testament anti-type fulfillment. So you're not applying typology in the epistles, okay? So that's another big, massive difference, all right? All, allegorical interpretations across all of scripture you have the literal meaning, and then there's a spiritual meaning behind the text, okay? And this is this is what they're doing. They're, so they have an allegorical interpretation for uh, the Good Samaritan. They have an, allegor an allegorical interpretation for everything, all right? So this is really a, a hermeneutical lens by which they're interpreting all of Scripture. So they would use the allegorical, and, and, and the reason for this is there was a lot of heresies that were cropping up. And, and the, the apostolic fathers were saying, how do we combat these heresies? And so they would, in, in those hard texts in the Old Testament where the, where the heretics were rejecting, they were like saying, no, 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 there's benefit. Here's my allegorical interpretation, okay? Or they would say, no, 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 there's, there's, there's benefit here. Uh, this is the spiritual meaning, okay? And then the, so that, that's kind of why the, this allegorical interpretation was embraced, because you had a lot of heresies cropping up. And then the other, the other form of interpretation, and this is actually going back to the Jewish. So again, the, the same interpretative methods are being recycled. Uh, this, this apostolic traditional interpretation, what does that sound like we just discussed? What does that sound like? From, from our previous discussion earlier in the PowerPoint. Who else leaned on tradition? <laughs> it's the Roman Catholic. The, okay, so that's true. The, 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 this is the predecessors of the Roman Catholic, but I'm saying in our PowerPoint, Dubai, there was, we had uh, the earlier schools. What other school of interpretation really leaned on this traditional, this, uh, in, this tradition of interpretation? Uh, wasn't it the rabbinic Judaism? They had this, uh, they, they leaned on the tradition of the rabbis. Yeah, so again, the, the, 
this interpretation is being recycled now in the church. And of course, there is a need. So I'm not, we should be, we should not be arrogant. We shouldn't be like, how could they do that? Uh, they're doing the best they can. And at the same time, we, we need to reject this type of interpretation and we need to be on guard against it. Uh, but there is a context as to why it came up. Then, then from the apostolic fathers, you now have the Alexandrian school. And so again, we've heard of the Alexandrian school before. Uh, who is the, the big dog that they followed in the Alexandrian school from the earlier PowerPoint? Who's the big dog? The Greek, the Greek guy that they all followed. Does that, someone want to get, take a whack at it? Who's the Greek uh, philosopher that everyone Plato. followed? Plato. 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 So they follow, they follow Plato and they also follow Philo. So Philo is the predecessor and you have Plato and you have Philo as well. Yeah, both, both. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so it's the same, no new thing under the sun. What I want us to see is that these, these interpretation, it keeps coming back and we need to be on guard when we start seeing it happen in our contemporary day. We need to always be vigilant to guard our interpretative method. Obviously always looking at scripture, but being aware that these are cycles. These are cycles that keep coming back. Um, and so uh, allegory and Greek philosophy, especially Platonic. So uh, Danny got the gold star. Platonic philosophy became the major hermeneutic of the church. And so this, this, really, this really becomes the basis. Um, later, Aristotle is, is, is a, a, heavy, a heavy influencer as well. Um, and because of these, because of these, you have the church councils. And so, again, what's driving this is these heresies that are coming up. But you can see how there's a slow, a slow digression into bad interpretation and bad decisions by the church. So then they come up with the, this, really this statement of apostle successors were the true interpreters of scripture. And so really that that is that is forming the foundation of what Henry mentioned that the Roman Catholic Church is developing this church tradition. This is the predecessor for it, and now it's the Roman Catholic Church that is the true interpreters. They have the authority. Not no no longer is it sola scriptura. It's now uh, the uh, the apostles, the the apostles and the apostle successors. Okay. And this is the predecessor for the Roman Catholic Church. Um, now, at the same time during this, there was, there was some good. So uh, Augustine had some good principles that kind of brought us back to a literal interpretation. Look at, look at just really quick some of Augustine's principles. Number one, the clear passages must interpret the vague. So this is, this is a guiding principle that we still use today. An unclear passage cannot reinterpret a clear passage. Rather, the clear passage has to speak clarity to the unclear. That is a fundamental principle that we'll see later in the course that we still must practice today to guard good theology. The unclear does not explain the clear. The clear explains the vague. So the clear passages on salvation by grace alone clarify those that are somewhat vague, that seem to be purport, supporting a works-based salvation. It's not the other way around, okay? And of course, people will say, oh, no, well, mine's more clear. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. But, but the clear passages must interpret the vague. Uh, number two, one must always consult the rule of faith. And so Augustine is not saying uh, the rule of faith would be like the, the, the history of the interpretation. The tradition, okay? And so this is a guiding principle that all of us must follow. In this, in this hermeneutical method, we're going to be following this principle, the, the rule of faith. That is to say that we should always consult our interpretation. We should always compare it to historical theology. We don't come up with new interpretation, meaning to say that it's, it's, if it's never been in, in, in history, 
a, a text hasn't been interpreted a certain way, we should be we should be very cautious to not give this new radical interpretation that has never been given before. And so, as opposed to the church saying, no, we are the true interpreters, Augustine said, we need to consult. We need to consult with orthodoxy, with historic theology. And so we all should say, yes, amen. When I interpret a passage, I want to consult with church history, with historical theology, to make sure that I'm not giving some new it's a check. It's a check. Uh, next, we have um, now we would we would maybe put place this the opposite way, uh, but uh, um, I did not look at the primary source to see if there was an order to Augustine's step. If this could just be different ideas, but if there is still a conflict, look at the broader context. So yes, as we interpret, we're looking at the broader context. We should be doing that first, okay? <laughs> but we're looking at the broader context of our passage to, 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 to clarify, to reconcile interpretative differences. So these are good principles. This is from Augustine. This is 16 centuries ago. And so, and so um, these are good principles that we should, we should be uh, I'm applying this in our in our interpretation today. So we're we're casting out the bad and we're keeping the good. Our interpretative method should be in line with church history. Okay. Let's let's already seven twenty four. Let's take a break. Okay, great. So let's continue on in our um, in our PowerPoint. And so again, just want to highlight that. These are three principles by Augustine, and they're great principles, principles that we should follow. And so we're seeing both the good, the bad, and the ugly in the history of interpretation. And again, I want to emphasize that this is for, uh, this is for our benefit. This is for our benefit and also for our church's benefit. Moving on to the Middle Ages. So Middle Ages was a time of, sometimes they're, they're called the Dark Ages. And although there was a lot of ignorance, there was a lot of, um, corruption in the church. There was some good things in the Middle Ages. You, we really start to see a, a, a push back, the pen, pushing the pendulum back to a literal interpretation. Although, although the during the Middle Ages, the the allegorical interpretation really is just coming to full bloom. We're going to see this in a second. Um, there is this movement back to to a literal a literal hermeneutic. And so, uh, as the, the, the PowerPoint says, it's the dominant hermeneutical method. So during this time, remember, the church is now the keepers of interpretation. The church is in charge of interpretation. The, the laity cannot interpret the word of God. They're at, they're at the pure mercy of the church. And, and the church is promoting this allegorical interpretation. And so, the, uh, although there are good things, it's wrong to say that we should just call the Middle Ages the Dark Ages. There was a lot of darkness during this time. Now, this this really encapsulates the issue with the the the, the allegorical interpretation. During the Middle Ages, there was this development of four senses of Scripture. There's four senses of Scripture. So this was the example that was given uh, concerning Israel's crossing of the Red Sea. So this is just an example that was cited in in our reading. But there was four senses. The literal sense is the actual crossing by Moses and Israel. Okay, so that's the literal. So the, the text itself, that's the first one. But then there's also an allegorical interpretation. The Christian's baptism and new life in Christ. Then there's the moral. <clears throat> there is the moral. <clears throat> the obedient Christian crosses from life's difficulties, uh, uh, to earthly blessings, or I, maybe there's a typo there. Um, maybe that's spiritual blessings. <laughs> that doesn't sound right. So, but anyway, there's this moral, this call to, 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 to be moral, obedient, obedient Christians. Oh, no, okay, so um, obedient Christians receive earthly blessings. So, so, so maybe that is accurate. And then the anagogical, the anagogical, interpretation, which is almost like, like an eschatological or a, a, a future type interpretation. That is Christian's final crossing from death 
to eternal life. Okay, now, I first want to say that nothing that's stated here is wrong. Okay, so um, the, the truths that are being taught. Now, connecting it with the, with, with, with the crossing, the interpretative method is probably wrong. We're going to discuss that. But so it's true that obedient Christians can receive earthly blessings. They're not guaranteed, but they can receive, we can receive earthly blessings. It's true that we will finally cross death in the eternal life. Uh, it's true that we have our Christian baptism uh, begins our new life with Christ. So these are all true statements. The difficulty is the applying, applying these, this type of interpretation to the actual crossing of the Red Sea. The other thing I want to say is that this is not just, this is an example, but it's for all of Scripture. So you could use this, this type of, of interpretation in Revelation and Peter. It's a grid. They were applying this uh, hermeneutical grid. So I do want to say that looking at these truths, maybe there isn't, these truths aren't speaking heresy, right? These might not be speaking heresy, but the method is the problem. Okay, the method is the problem. Does everyone see that? Does someone want to ask a question? I, I want to make sure everyone's tracking with what, with what I'm saying here. Is, is, do we have a question? Uh, Pastor Tim. Yes, go ahead. During this year, this uh, 1,000 years, this is a 1,000 years period, and these were dominated by the, by the, let's say the priest, yeah. the Roman Catholic. Yeah. Okay. These were the, so, 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 their influence, the influence during this period is brought down to the present situation. In, is this where the start of faith as being? Uh, faith is something like it's being sold. Yeah. So, so this is during this age is really where the Roman Catholic Church, the 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 previous the the the, the church councils is really the very beginning of the Roman Catholic Church or the transition from the universal Catholic. Catholic means universal. So, from the universal church that's orthodox that's moving into the Roman Catholic Church, and so during this one thousand years is really the solidification, the control of the Roman Catholic Church. So, yeah, so, so this is really what's occurring here. And, and all interpretation is now in the hands of the church. Uh, individuals cannot interpret the scripture. Um, they have to depend on the church. There's corruption. Um, uh, the transition from the end of the Middle Ages, or the, right, right up until right up until the the Protestant Reformation, you have the selling of indulgences. So the Catholic Church is is selling escape from jail. <laughs> um, there's a lot of corruption going on. Now that's the climax. That's towards the end. That's right before the Protestant Reformation. But you are correct that this is really going down a death spiral. And again, it's because th they have all these different interpretations. Maybe, maybe the truth that's being taught isn't wrong, but the method is wrong, and so there's no anchor. There's no anchor of the ship. It's just going wherever it's going to go. Uh, they're throwing the dice. Sometimes they're getting the six and they're right, and many times they're wrong. So that's really the problem, and that's why it's so important for us to maintain the historical grammatical uh, interpretative method. That's why it's so important to maintain it, and, and we'll go. We'll, we'll discuss that in the future, but. You can see it's not, it's not by chance that their allegorical interpretation and the church is going down. It, 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 they're, they're, now, maybe someone else would say I disagree. Fair enough. But, but for me, from my limited perspective, I would say that the, the two are connected. When you don't have the literal pro proclamation of the word, and that was also Luther. Luther, we'll see, he said that the proclamation of the word should be central, and instead it was the mass that was central. That, that, that's all during the, the, the Middle Ages. Um, uh, the proclamation of the word is not exalted. The literal meaning is not exalted. And so uh, there's a lot of abuse. Abuse is rampant. Uh, great, great observation, Henry. Yes, yeah, so, certainly. Um, so this is before Reformation, right? So it's um, 590 to 1500. Yes. So uh, this hermeneutical grid uh, is 
to my knowledge, is based on Augustinian kind of interpretation, which Augustine doesn't know how to read Greek and Hebrew. He purely dependent on his Latin understanding of, you know, hermeneutical yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah, yeah. interpretations. And um, Augustine also is the proponent, aside from Origen, Origen, or Origen, uh, he is the proponent of the allegorical types of interpretation of the Bible, which is he also said that uh, that you could previously you could uh, Augustine with regards to a plain sense of the scripture. Uh, yeah. So, um, so this 100, 1,000 years of, of, of hermeneutical um, process. Um, so, is this the reason why the reformations are really, you know, um, you know, trying to react on the matter of hermeneutical, which is, of course, our, our hermeneutic will will always, uh, you know, will always uh, give birth to our doctrinal and faith and practices in the church, which is. Yeah, at that time, Roman Catholic. Yeah, I, I missed the one part. You, you, what was the correlation again? What, what, that last part, you cut out for a second. Can you just repeat yourself? Uh, yeah, um, well, our, our hermeneutic, hermeneutical um, understanding of the scripture will, will always give birth to our, um, you know, faith and practices, which yeah. at, this, at this time, yeah, Roman Catholic system. Yeah, no, there, there. Yeah, there's a there's a, de a definite correlation. And going back to Augustine, there there was there was issues with uh, some of Augustine's interpretative method, as you mentioned, and also even some of his theology. So there is some theology we would strongly disagree with. There's some we really agree with. There's some we disagree with. So, um, but 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 the method the, the method. I think what you're saying and, and is that the 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 hermeneutical method is connected with the health of the church. There's a correlation between the two. Is, is that what you're saying? Is that the big point you're saying? Yes. Since, yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, yeah. Since Augustine, uh, Augustine was, was, you know, the proponent of Roman Catholicism. In fact, they, they are, Augustine was their theologian. Yeah. So he was, he was the, he was like, the, he was the predecessor. So, yeah. So they claim to him to be the father. Fair enough. But I, I do want to maybe separate him a little bit because because what Roman the Roman Catholic Church became I don't think he would support at all. So to be to, in fairness, he was the predecessor. They used a lot of him as a foundation. Fair enough. At the same time, I think that a lot of I think that if he was transported in time to the 15th century, he would probably have been Protestant. <laughs> he would have joined the Protestants more than the Roman Catholic Church. So. You know, but no, you are, your point is well taken. And yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to assume that Augustine was just pie in the sky, you know, perfect. There was, there was issues, but he's, he is a product of his culture and his time. And so you're right. He, during that time, Latin is emphasized, not the Greek and Hebrew text. You're right. And so, he, you know, it's not until the Renaissance when they really go back, the humanists go back humanists use in a good sense they go back to the to the classics to hebrew and greek uh in your reading tim have you come across this period because in some books this is also called the dark ages uh the oppressive period etc and uh my question is has there has anybody written about this period a similar to that period of more than 400 years when God was silent and then suddenly Moses came and there was uh, a different joy of, uh, from the side of Israelites that somehow there is now a new leader in the, yeah. in the Israelites, from the Israelites, from yeah. Moses. And then uh, it started with, uh, and then came later the Mosaic law and then the Jews became a different group of people. Yeah. So the parallelism is uh, that in this period of dark ages, it seems God also was nowhere to be recognized. And so there came so many philosophies that came, so many thinkers. And then uh, it seems the church seized the opportunity to be the spokesperson of God. That's why it, it came to be that it is the start of the period where the church was the very dominant institution in the world. Even uh, affecting the kingdoms of England and other uh, states around Europe, especially. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. The, the, the role of the church, especially the Roman, the Roman Catholic Church based in Rome, was the dominant uh, institution, uh, uh, crisscrossing even the political governments. So yeah. was there somebody who thought of a parallelism between this period and that period when God was silent until Moses came? So, so I am not familiar, to be honest with you, in my, you know, church history is not my area of study, so my area is New Testament, so I, I don't know a lot of the secondary sources of someone who's made, I will say that I've heard and I've discussed before that it does seem that there's cycles, there's, there's cycles, you even see that in the scripture, right, the judges, they're going down and then there's revival, Israel, they're going down, revival, the church going down and revival, you have the, the Dark Ages going before the Protestant Re Reformation. You have even in the U.S. the Great Awakening. So there was like a deep darkness. And so, you know, I'm sure that someone's probably written on maybe tracing that theme, that theme of, 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 go, of downward and then a revival. And I think the encouragement should be for all of us is that, you know, we look at around the world today and we do see in some sense a lot of a falling away just like Paul talks about in First and Second Timothy. And it's, number one, it shouldn't surprise us, but looking at history, we see that, you know, should the Lord tarry and not return, the falling away, there can still be this revival. And we see those, those cycles. So, um, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep my eyes peeled if, if I see something like that. But in your research, when you're looking, you can look for trends. You can look for trends. Um, uh, I will make a recommendation on CCEL, the website CCEL and the cloud resource tool. There's a, a, a church historian, Philip Scaff. Uh, he wrote six or eight volumes on church history. That might really uh, pique your interest. It, it ends like after the Reformation, but he was an excellent uh, church historian, and, and that might that might really pique your interest. And and I'll, and I'll keep a, I'll keep a lookout for for other resources, as you mentioned. So great question though. That's a great okay. observation. Can, I can you text me, can you text me the full name of the guy yeah. and, uh, yeah. and the book or uh, journal, please? So I, well, I was yeah. able to get it right, okay? Thank you. So I don't forget, email me, just email me asking me for the information just, and, I'll, and I'll respond to your email so I don't forget, great. Okay, let's move on because I do, I do wanna move on. Um, I wanna get to, to Roman, so let's, let's move on here. Um, uh, and then, uh, after the Middle Ages, the last, the last thing, this is positive, in the Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas, again, his Summa Theologica is, the, is considered the pinnacle of, of Catholic theology. Um, but the big, and so we don't agree with everything Thomas Aquinas said. We probably don't agree with a lot of what he said. But, but he emphasized the return to a literal hermeneutic, and that really resonates with us. And that was... that. He was a predecessor that really allowed for, that allowed for uh, Martin Luther and these other Renaissance men, these other humanists, Erasmus, to come on the scene and push for the Greek and for the Hebrew text. Because if you're looking at the meaning behind the text, you don't care about the Greek or Hebrew. Who cares about the Greek or Hebrew? We're just going to go high in the sky, whatever we do. We don't need we, no time for translation work. But if we say, no, the, the meaning is in the text, the meaning is in the plain sense, then the Hebrew, the Greek, the Aramaic, because there's a couple portions in the Old Testament that's Aramaic, that is foundational. That is foundational. And so um, this is setting up for this massive Protestant Reformation. And so now we have the Reformation, A.D. 5, 1500 to 1650, and it's... Um, during the Reformation, there is a renewed interest in studying the Bible in its original Hebrew and Greek languages. And so this is, again, when, when the Word of God is exalted, especially in the original languages, there are so many bad translations with the, with, with the Latin. When they went back to the, to the Hebrew and the Greek, there was illumination, there was revival. And so, you know, I, I do want to say this. I do want to say this, maybe this is controversial um, here in, in Region 8, I don't know, um, but I want to emphasize, <clears throat> if you can study and learn Hebrew and Greek, I highly recommend it. The, the analogy that one of my, fr my, my friend from 
from Togo. So he's a, 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 a from Togo. He got his doctorate of ministry at one of the schools I went to. He said to me, uh, reading the, the scripture in Hebrew and Greek, it can compare in that to just reading it in English is can be compared to watching a movie on black and white versus IMAX. <laughs> IMAX is like the biggest screen in the world. And so you would still see the same story. Black and white, you're still gonna get the same story. You're gonna get you're gonna see the plot, you're gonna see the conclusion. <clears throat> but the experience, <laughs> and that's really true. When you see the significance, the extra meaning in Hebrew and Greek. So what I want to emphasize is that if you can, I want people to consider studying Hebrew and Greek. It's not for everyone, not everyone can do it, but if you can. Um, I want you to think about that because here it's the, it's the, it's the studying the Bible in the original Hebrew and Greek that brings about the Protestant Reformation. If they just stayed with Latin, it would never have happened. If they stayed with that, there was bad translations. Repentance was translated like penitence, do penance instead of repent. <laughs> bad translations, very bad translations. Um, uh, uh, I think charity was was not love it was it was a uh, again the emphasis on this workspace instead of this the sacrificial love and so idea um and you even see that carried over into the king james so that's why king james has charity they don't have love in translations um again i'm not attacking the king james but it, that was a compromise with the catholics in the in the in the translation committee but it's bad and, and that comes from the latin vulgate and so if the, 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 the recommitment of the original language is what brought about the Protestant Reformation. It's what allowed Luther to see the truth, to bring about that foundational truth. You want to know something? The foundation to the, the Re Reformation was not salvation by grace through faith alone. The foundation was sola scriptura. Scripture alone. That enabled them to study the Greek and Hebrew. And then from there, they came up with grace alone, salvation by faith alone, uh, 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 in Christ alone, Christ's sacrifice alone. No, none of these sacraments. Christ's sacrifice alone saves. Not the works. Christ's sacrifice alone. Our faith in him, and it's only by God's grace for God's glory alone. And those are the five solas of the Reformation, and the foundation is the Bible, <laughs> the scriptures. And so people will say, you don't need to learn Hebrew and Greek. And it is true. You can preach the gospel. You can teach without knowing Hebrew and Greek. And it's not for everyone. Please don't misunderstand me. But there needs to be some people. I'm thinking of Region 8. Some people in Region 8 need to become passionate. We need to have – everyone has a different gifting. But no doubt there is, God has gifted some for this passion for Greek and Hebrew, and, and, and we all work together. So those that are gifted in evangelism, those who are gifted in church plan, those who are gifted in being a pastor, um, um, th those are different gifts. The gifts of teaching, the gifts of, 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 of the languages, we need to be working together. But there could be an amazing reformation, um, but it's <laughs> the word of God must be central. It must be central in all things. Uh, moving along here, uh, Martin Luther. Question, question, uh, Tim, before we go. Yeah. Is the Greek and Hebrew language that uh, we are talking about, is it the same Hebrew language and Greek language that is now being spoken in Israel and in Greece? Is it uh, the same language or a different? It, it, functionally, it's different. Functionally, it's different. The wording is different. I remember um, uh, you can learn the, the, the words will be different. The word, it's it's the comparison is look up Beowulf, look up the, the, the literature Beowulf in old English. Try to read Beowulf in old English. You cannot. It's like a foreign language. You cannot read. And that's, that's old English. And that's just 500 years from modern English. And it's the same ancient Hebrew and Greek is, is very different than modern Hebrew and Greek. Now, if you learned, if you learn modern Hebrew and Greek, it would be easy for you to pick up on ancient, but, but, but the words are different meanings. There's different pronunciations. Yeah. Great question. Luther, he had two 
he had two big ideas, <laughs> two big ideas. Number one, scripture is its own best interpreter. So this is a reaction against this church tradition that has taken over, this apostolic interpretation that cannot be questioned. He says, no, 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 no. Scripture is his best interpreter. And that's similar to what Augustine said, right? That's similar to what Augustine said, that we, we use Scripture to interpret Scripture. And then number two, Luther rejected the allegorical method. Scripture had one simple meaning, its historical sense. Now, again, in fairness, Luther did have other lenses. I'm not going to get it. That's advanced, that's advanced uh, hermeneutics. So Luther was not consistent functionally. He still practiced, um, um, he had several different lenses of hermeneutics that he applied to the scriptures. We won't go into them tonight because it's an introduction. But at least explicitly he stated that scripture has one simple meaning, okay? And that's something that we can take. That's, that's something that we can take and we need to embrace. So I hope that you're seeing as we work through this that we're really, we're, we're, we're again, we're, we're taking, we're in line with old, we're, we're in line with church history. We're in line with historical theology, but we're looking critically at it and we're rejecting those things that are not true. And so uh, we need to be always assessing, taking the good and, and rejecting the bad. Number three. So the third thing that he had is, um, so uh, he read the Bible through a Christocentric lens. He took up typological interpretation just like the New Testament authors. So again, we want to say yes. Now, now maybe I think, I think he overdid it. I think he, he took this too far. Um, uh, you know, so, so I want to say very qualified, very qualified that, that we should be looking at Scripture through um, through a typological lens, looking at that relationship between Old and New Testament, very qualified with very specific parameters, in which the Old Testament text needs to be also supporting it. Um, but we can agree with with these three truths that Luther practiced, um, all, albeit that maybe for sure he there was mistakes, there was there was overemphases along the way. Okay. Next, post-Reformation. So we're almost done here, and then we'll take our last break. Uh, Post-Reformation. So um, during the Reformation, one negative downside was after 100 years, there was a movement to really dead orthodoxy. They became so focused on getting the right doctrine that there was some people that uh, uh, they, they did not focus on piety. They did not focus on morality. There was just, we need to get all the doctrine right. Okay, so they really overemphasized knowledge. Okay, and so post-Reformation, there was a reaction to that. The reaction is this pietistic movement. That is, uh, pietism uh, literally means uh, godly. So um, that, that comes originally from a Greek word, and it just means godly. Now, if today we say you're a pious person, it's not, <laughs> it has very negative connotation. If you say he's pious, you're saying he's arrogant, right? But, but pious just means godly. So there was a pietistic movement in the sense, this is in a positive sense. That is that they sought to revive Christianity. They're, they're, they're taking the Protestant uh, group by uh, studying the scripture, and then they're emphasizing prayer, personal morality, and they're, re they're reacting against this intellectual dogmatism, this, this dead orthodoxy. Okay, and so we, we, we in, in one sense, we could be pietistic, although, so, you know, there is different, there's different groups within the pietistic movement, and some of them we would disagree with. So, you know, w without trying to paint a broad, a broad strokes, um, we, we can take this importance of group Bible study. So we have small groups today, right? Uh, we emphasize prayer. We emphasize personal morality. And so this is something that is not new to us. If someone says, you know, there, there is a pietistic, a brethren movement where some of them will say that, you know, everyone got it wrong. We're going back to the early church. It's like, well, no, no, no. You're practicing something similar to what they were doing through the centuries. So, so we don't want to just cut ourselves off from church history. We don't want to do that. Um, number two, Jonathan Edwards, you know, Henry's asking for, for good people to read, very hard to read. So Jonathan Edwards is not an easy read, 
but a lot of his resources are free. And there's actually a, a website. I'll, I'll set up the website, but it has all of Jonathan Edwards stuff. He is a very good, uh, he is an incredible preacher. He preached one of the most famous sermons of all time that started the great awakening in the U S sinners in the hands of an angry God. And they said that he literally was up there and he just said it in a monotone voice. But the, the, the message was so powerful, people were crying, and they were confessing their sin and repenting. And, and he's just this Puritan that's just, you know, congregationalist, that's just, you know, monotone speaking. There's no, he's not threatening, he's not trying to manipulate, he's just preaching. Uh, one of the most famous sermons of all time, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And um, uh, he says that you're dangling by a thread over, over God's wrath and just very powerful. Just, but really it comes down to the work of the spirit. And so Jonathan Edwards struck this really good balance. He was a preacher. He loved preaching yet. He was really emphasizing doctrinal teaching. So he's very theologically deep yet. He's very applicational. And so that's, a, a, that's, that's something that we should resonate with as pastors, as leaders, we want to be very applicational and we want to have, we want to be doctrinally sound. With the good comes the bad. So, so post-Reformation, here comes the bad. And the bad is rationalism. Uh, rationalism isn't, it's, it's, in one sense, it's not bad. In another sense, it really has negative connotations. So <coughs> um, what I mean to say is that there are some aspects of rationalism that could be redeemable. But this, this, this deep truth of what it is is actually very negative in the context of the church. And so rationalism says that the human mind is an independent authority to, capable of determining truth. And we categorically reject that. And then in connection with this, in, in connection with this, um, uh, hold on, someone makes a comment here. Sonny says, Jonathan Edwards highly recommend he makes his uncle kill himself by hearing this sermon. So... I don't know, sir. I didn't know that. Is that true or is that a joke, Sonny? Yeah, it's, it's true. I, I'm reading that because I, I done my, my, my biological um, research on Jonathan Edwards. And I there you go. A, a there you go. Yeah. Wow. So he's very, it's highly recommended by Sonny. So yeah, so uh, the feeling is mutually. Check him out. It is a hard read though. It, if you're not very good at English, it will be very slow. So I, it's hard for me to read. <laughs> um, anyway, um, but with rationalism, uh, they subjected God to reasoning. And you cannot subject the infinite to the finite. And so um, this is going to have massive implications, though, in the church to come. Because if you subject God and God's will and God's plan of salvation to rationalism, that's why you have so many heresies, you have uh, false doctrine in the church because you can't, you, you, you can't, you can't, you're, you're literally saying God as God is underneath man. And I'm going to figure God out. It's really very arrogant. And this has huge, this impacts the church. This leads to the modern movement and it's the predecessor to the historical critical method and they say the Bible is just a human work of literature. And so the historical critical me method cuts apart the scripture and rejects all the things that is not subject to rationalism, is not subjected to scientific inquiry. So all supernatural is jettisoned out. And you do have, you do have authors that you have to be aware because they are following this type of method. Um, not at, there was a school I was, um, it, uh, that I was working with and there were some students at the school that liked several teachers in, in our, um, in mainline Christianity in the U S and they're following this historical critical method. And so, um, if you want to know those teachers, just message me privately later, we can talk. Um, uh, but, but some of the, some of the, uh, leaders in Christianity, be really careful who you're listening to, um, because there is some really bad theology coming out of the U.S. There's some good stuff and some really bad stuff. So, um, and they're mixing that. They're mixing it with with truth and error. So, 
you need to be very careful what you're listening to coming out of the US. Um, liberal theology. So you've maybe heard of the term liberal theology and you want to say, what is that? So we're not going to go into all the details of liberal theology. This is a good definition if someone says to you, what is liberal theology? It is uh, the reformulation of Christian theology around reason, science, freedom, and experience. So those are the major tenets. Reason, rationalism, reason, science, freedom, and experience. What is objective there? You might say science, but even science is not objective. Science is changing, right? Uh, the scientific method. Um, there's, there's objectivity in science, and there's very much subjectivity in science, especially biology. And so um, there's nothing concrete in liberal theology. And it focuses upon emphasizing human goodness and progress and continuities between the divine and human. So they want to emphasize humanity's goodness, humanity's uh, evolution, the closeness of God to man. And we want to say, no, there is no closeness between creator and creation. Specifically, post-fall, okay? The creator is completely different than the creation. There is no proximity between the two. There is no closeness between the two. It requires the Son of God to become man to reconcile the two. God with us. And so, but they, they will emphasize, they will minimize the sin nature they will, they, will, they will reject the new birth. They will say that man is inherently good. The problem with man is not the sin nature, but man's environment. And there's, there's so many philosophical and uh, ideological major problems with this, okay? But there's a lot of scholars, there's a lot of books, there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, this influences a lot of writings coming out of the, out of the U.S., coming out of Europe, we have to be so careful. And you have it, I'm mentioning this because you have it in the Philippines. I see it in the Philippines. I see it in academia when I was in Manila. I see it, I see it you know, in some of the big institutions in Manila, in the church. You have it. You have it in the church. So uh, liberalism has come to the Philippines. So you just need to be aware of it. Lastly, and this is really, liberalism is here, but postmodernism is really here. This rejects objective truth, the power of reason, and claims universality. So it rejects objective truth. It actually rejects reason, and it rejects anything universal. So truth is, is um, as the community and individuals define it. That's postmodernism. And so when you hear people say, I feel this, I feel that, when you start hearing people say, I just feel, I just feel that's not right. That is, infl that is being influenced by postmodernism. I think this is, this is not to disagree with you, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said something that there's no close proximity between the creation and the creator, right? Yeah, so I said there was uh, post-curse. So yeah, post-curse, yeah. And even first uh, at one level, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and I'm just thinking, and this is just a discussion, how do you reconcile that with the word of God, that we are created in the image of God? Yeah, so that would be, that would be pre, that would be pre-curse, that'd be pre-curse. Mm -hmm. and, okay. so, and so even, and so even in, even in uh, the, the garden, God is walking, walking with man, and and man and, and and is dependent upon God. So so it's not to say that there isn't there isn't some there isn't this fellowship. Um, what what I'm referring to uh, continuities between the divine and human. Maybe I'll make a clarification. What what, what liberal theology is they're referring to ontology, not relationship. Ontology. So ontologically, there is no closeness. When we say ontology, that's being who we are. There's no closeness, although we are, we are made in God's image, 
there is no closeness between God's being and our being. He is com- uh, he's infinite. We are finite. As, as close as the infinite is to the finite, that is as close as God is to man, ontologically speaking, or in, in our being. So, so um, I appreciate the question. So maybe I'll make that, that, that clarification there. Maybe that's helpful. Does that make sense? Yes, Tim. Thank you for that. That's You're welcome. And, 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 th- and thanks for the question. And I want to emphasize this. Don't ever qualify your question by, this is to disagree. It's fine. Say what you're going to say. I will not be offended. Please, just say what you're going to say. And, um, and, 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 and if you feel that you're, I've said something that you disagree with, I don't want you to ever take something just because I said it. I want you to, to think about it, and I don't want you to feel that I'm pressuring you. Um, so uh, great question, though, Alex, and I, and I appreciate that because that allowed us to clarify. Great. Thank you. Thank you question, for being question. gracious. I have a question, Tim. Oh, boy. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you have heard of uh, the principle of existentialism? Yes. Uh, is it correct to say that uh, this is part of modern postmodernism? Yeah, uh, n- not um, postmodernism. It's definitely rational and 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 <coughs> part of the enlight post and part of the light the result of the enlightenment. I have to think about whether it's directly connected to. Postmodernism. Let me think about that question. You're asking, you're asking specifically in connection with postmodernism, correct? Yeah. Let, let, let me think about that question. I'll get back to you. Yeah. Let me let me think about that. Uh, um. Uh. With regards to the question of uh, Koya Boboy, I think regarding existentialism, there are there there was a Christian uh, uh Danish philosopher at the same time Christians by the name of Soren Kierkegaard who is also an existentialist. Uh, you call it theist. He made a commentary on the book of James. I think that's that's the only thing I know that he made that uh, regarding. So, um, so is is in, in to my understanding, existentialism is not on. It's not it's not bad philosophy itself because even this Christian philosopher Sorin, uh take that philosophy and you know. Yeah, let's so, let's think about that because because postmodernism is existentialism does exist before postmodernism. So so I'm thinking about whether it's a a precursor or really still part of okay the issue of, of yeah. postmodernism. What was that? Yeah, the very issue of Sani, sir. Uh, yeah. yeah, the very issue of postmodernism is is that what that's. I mentioned before that uh, you know readers' response. Yeah. So uh, with regards to hermeneutic language. Great. So so yeah. So so within, and we're going to discuss this probably next week or several weeks later. The the the, the reader response is really directly connected with this postmodernism. The 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 postmodernism is the the, the two are. Um, there's a direct correlation between the two. Um, the the reader response is almost as if it's it's a result from postmodernism, yeah, yeah, good, and and that that's where we see that's where we see it directly impacting hermeneutic, because the reader response there is no absolute there is no objective meaning in the text it's whatever it's whatever it's whatever you take it to mean there's there's no it's just your response to the text so I, I well, let's let's get very practical here for a minute this is a concern. This is a concern um, when 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 we do small groups. So this is very applicational now. When we when we do when we do a small group, um, there sh- there should be a time in small group when we allow different people to give application or to say or, or or to give their their input on the text. That's fine, but we do need to be careful that when we're when we're doing small group and we're doing Bible study, it's not just what does the text mean to you. What does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? Okay, let's just take these truths and synthesize. Now, it could be that all three are different complementary truths from the text. Fair enough. It could be. That's fine. But if they're giving different interpretations and we're just accepting them all as, okay, that benefits us, that's actually postmodernism at its core. And that's against a literal meaning of the text. The text means one thing. So one is right and two are wrong. 
Okay, so um, we need to be careful as we're as we're doing small group. That's not to say that we have different applications. So in in in, in um, you can give different application, but when it comes to the meaning of the text, it's not just everyone is right. Okay, so or if we're doing a small group Bible study where we're looking to move towards conclusions, you know, maybe someone's going to give part of the right answer, someone's going to give another part, and then you're combining, that's fine. But but you might have someone give a completely wrong answer, and in a very gracious or maybe um, or maybe just in your synthesis portion, you don't mention it. But but there needs to be a definitive, this is what the text says, um, and then of course maybe there's different application, okay? So so that we, do, we in our small group we need to not be afraid of 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 defining the truth of it should not be postmodern because I've been in a lot of Bible studies in the U.S. and here where it's just literally different answers and and all of them are accepted and and that that is that is postmodernism in our Bible study that's practical that's it that's right there go ahead if someone wants to add a question or make a comment. Question team. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, in post, does it fall under postmodernism of people really speaks about when when they speak and say that you know this is what I heard about uh, this is what I heard from God this is what God said to me so where would that fall because that most of the time that's what we hear from my, my latest preachers or teachers but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it depends. I'd have to see the specific context. That could also be coming from a a different position. That, that is that God is still speaking today. That that would be a different because they're not postmodernism at its core is saying there's no objective truth w within the text. There's no objective truth. The, the the text means different things. Okay, so if so if the, 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 the speaker would say, God spoke to me here, and it conflicts with the text, but both are true, that would then be postmodernism, okay? But if he's just saying God spoke to me, that's probably more in like a Pentecostal uh, continuation. When I say continuation, that means that God is still speaking today. The canon could be still open. Um, and so God's giving new meaning today. That, that would be different. You'd really have to look at the context. But postmodernism, just think about postmodernism. Postmodernism, you read the text, and there's different meanings that people give, and they're, they're conflicting each other. And, and, and maybe you can say, we disagree, there's two different ones. But if you say both are right, um, that's postmodern. If you accept two different truths that are antithetical or two different truths for one text, uh, that's postmodernism. Well, that's what you believe. This is what I believe. Or, or, or let's just accept as both. But would there be a danger when you when you claim that way that God spoke to me, and like claiming yourself that God has really spoken to me, like what we mostly hear from other preachers? Is that is it that dangerous also? Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, and 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 that's incredibly dangerous because because. When you say God spoke to me, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I'm just referring to the specific question concerning postmodernism. I'm just, I am cautious to connecting the two because, because you don't want to. You, uh, there's different. There's other different theologies out there. So, like a Pentecostal uh, continuation type movement would maybe would not be the same. So I'm just, I'm just saying I want to be hesitant, but no, you're very right that it's very dangerous and we need to be very cautious with how we use God spoke to me. And um, not to say that we shouldn't use it because even for me, I feel that there are times where God clearly speaks through something and I want to share that. So it, we just have to be incredibly cautious, incredibly cautious when we use it, when we hear someone saying that. Yeah, maybe Ray's question is asked because he doesn't believe though those guys are really hearing God's word. Or he doesn't oh. believe really God spoke to them. Maybe that's the that's the essence of the question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. So, so Ray, no, yeah. So, so they could be using, they could be using. If that's the case, they could be using this type of contract, and people are accepting it because that's now just in our, that's part of our worldview, and no one really knows. Fair enough. Yeah. Absolutely. That could be. Yeah. Alex, go ahead. 
this might be like a follow through question with Kuya Ray. Okay. But this might be like sound basic. But what is really the core differences about Pentecostal, Protestant, Baptist? Because, okay, we are Tacloban Bible community. And how do we really classify us? Yes. Are we not posting some religion? You know, because I have a Roman Catholic background. And yeah. when I became a believer, I was like, like a bit confused. There's a lot, like Baptist, Pentecostal, Protestant. What, what is really the core differences? Okay, so the, so the at the absolute core, the absolute core, all of us that are within a born again Bible believing church that would not be Catholic, we would all be Protestants. Okay, okay. so Protestant, Protestant means to protest, and so specifically, the first Protestants in the 15th, 16th century, they protested the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church doctrine. Okay. Fundamentally, uh, they they believed in two authorities. Uh, the, the, the authority of the church itself and also the word of God. That's what the Catholic church said. And, and the okay. problem, no, sola scriptura, that's the foundation. Okay, so all of us who hold to sola scriptura uh, would be Protestants. So, so that would be Presbyterians, that would be, that would be Methodists, that would be Baptists, that would be Pentecostals, that would, uh, at a certain level, Anglicans too, <laughs> Anglicans as well. Um, yeah, Episcopalian that yeah. happens in the U.S. Okay, and then you have specific categories within the theological categories. Context. Categories. Okay, so, categories. What, what, there is distinctions that separate Baptists from Anglicans that separate Baptists from Pentecostals. You could even okay. have a combination between the two. You could have Baptistic Pentecostals or Pentecostal Baptists. So, so there's a lot of different. <laughs> there's a lot of different nuances. Maybe we can have a conversation together some other time, just because it's so big. Yeah. Um, but we yeah. do one day. I, I do want to have a, a class just on this, so that so that yeah. because, because here's the thing, and this is for all of us. We need to think through our theology. We need to think through number one, our confession of faith. We need to think through our th theology, and every church needs to come up with this core distinctives of who you are, both historically and also present day. Because it, because it gives you identity. You have a framework to work through, work from, and everyone in your church can at least identify that framework. So, so you know, down the line, I hope that maybe one of the outcrops from EBST, one of the benefits can be where the church is, you can, each church is maybe going to come down slightly different. You know, no two churches are the same. Um, but you do need to think through as a church, where are we in all these different issues? Um, so it's a great question, and uh, we, <laughs> we don't have the time. <laughs> yeah, it, it, just, it, it just concerns me because, like, if you look at the Roman Catholic, it seems that we have a good structure at the yeah. outset, right? It, yeah. it seems we have a good structure. And if you look at the evangelical, the Protestant world, it seems that we are so diverse and disconnected, and I don't know. Yeah. Like, like, you know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, so I will, I will give some assurances here. When you look, when when it comes down, my perspective because so, to be clear, I have friends in all those categories that I, literally all the categories that I just mentioned to you. I have close friends and friends that I would say yes, we're 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 close brother. We fellowship. We enjoy each other. So what I'd say is that with with within the Protestant movement, there are core, non-negotiable, foundational truths that we all agree to. Of course. And then we have of these course. different, more secondary, tertiary issues. And the problem is that everyone accents those tertiary issues and secondary issues when in reality our core is really in agreement. You know, I, I worship, I worshiped in a Presbyterian church, I worshiped in a Baptist church, I worshiped in a, a Pentecostal church, and the worship services are close. And, and I've heard the gospel preached, I've heard good expo exposition. And so, yeah, so, so. That's not to say that we shouldn't think through our, each church should think through our own distinctives. The other thing I want to say is that, is that, um, is that there is a need for us to really, to really know what we believe because there are so many things, you know, sometimes we're saying it doesn't really matter. It does, it does matter. Um, mm. and, and, you know, 
your job is not just to believe what I want you to believe. Your job is for you as a church, you as individuals, to really make it your own. Um, so great question. You. You're welcome. Anyone else? And then we're going to take a break. Anyone else have, have something? I think we should be making our personal doctrine of faith. Yeah. Yeah. Because where we can understand where we are. Yeah. No, so, no, that's a, that is really good. And, and that is one of the goals that, that we've discussed in the past, correct? That as we work through the, 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 the curriculum to, to help each one of the students, you know, you as individuals, I have my own, I work through my own uh, position. Absolutely, that's, that's great. We need to be thinking through that. So, th so there's a long-term plan for that. And, and I appreciate uh, Kuya, Pastor Henry bringing up that uh, because that is one of the goals for EVST that we want to have, that each pastor, each leader, whether you're, you're, you're a leader in a small group, whether you're, you know, everyone should be doing theology. Um, everyone should be doing theology because it's to love God and love others. And, and that's, that's what it is. Okay, I'm going to just, well, let's have a break. Okay, let's go ahead and let's, let's begin we're going to try to get through this. I, I hope that we can. Um, if you can, turn in your Bibles to R Romans chapter 1, and we're going to start the hermeneutical process. Okay, so what I'm going to do really quick is I'm going to first review the, the method, and then we're going to, we're going to work through it. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to put, put up a and just read through an example of the of the method, and then we'll work through it. We'll we'll begin it now, and then finish it next week. I'm I'm sorry, it'll be more than next week, but we'll just start. I do want you to see because the the assignment we're, it will be connected with this. So so just really quick, the the concise method that everyone should have. If you don't have it, it's posted in our in our Facebook group, and um. um uh, I'm just going to read through this, and then we're going to go into uh, working through this 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 method. So uh, the steps are spiritual preparation. So you're supposed to pray. You choose your passage, which you've already done, and then you're going to look at uh, your location of the passage in relation relationship to salvation history. You're going to identify the genre. You're going to do a background study. Then you're going to really identify where your passage is in, in reference to the book. So you're going to identify an outline of the book, and then you're going to place your, your passage in, in relationship to the outline. And then you're going to do uh, some summaries of the preceding context and succeeding context. So you're really unpacking where your, 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 your text is. Then you're going to do some, you're going to make some questions. You're going to make some observations. You're going to identify key words and concepts that you're going to study and, and unpack. There's going to be a structure analysis. There'll be an exegetical outline and summary. And then that completes your observation stage. And then moving from there, you're going to have the explanation stage or explain it. And so there you're going to list theological truths. You're going to list Christological truths if there are some. You're going to exposit the text in your own words, so you're going to explain the text. Then you're going to create a theological outline, so you're converting your exegetical outline, which follows the structure analysis. You're going to convert it from a from a original context to a theological. What are the what are the the universal eternal truths that this is teaching? Okay. And then you're also going to have a theological summary. So you're going to write that theological outline in a wordy, one-sentence, long summary, including all the different components. And then, and then you're going to go down to apply it. So in the application stage, you're going to create this big idea. You're going to have a subject. You're going to have a complement. You're going to look at how Christ and the gospel is, is connected um, to the... Uh, how it's connected to the uh, uh, to your text, and then you're going to create a homiletical outline, and then lastly, you're going to do the introduction and conclusion, and below are just some tools that you can use, all right? So that's the big, that's the bird's eye view, okay? And so what I'm going to do next is I just want to 
Um, I have started the process. So I want to first, I'm going to read this to you and then we're gonna talk through the process, okay? So I wanted to do the process first, but because time is fleeting, I'm gonna read the, the, the exegetical paper, uh, portion to you. Uh, don't be stressed. And then if we have time, we'll work through the steps and then we'll finish on next week. Uh, It'll be more than next week, but the steps that, that we started today, okay? But you will be working on this this week, so that's why I do want to read this to you. I'm just going to read this so that you have an idea of what it's like, okay? So we're interpreting Romans 1, 16 to 17, and I do want to make one caveat. I'm reading this because this is in paragraph form. This is for the MAT and MAT students, but for the, the CT student certificate, you don't have to write in paragraph form. You can if you want to, but that's optional. If you just want to do bullet point, that's fine as well. So you can just do bullet point. You're not writing in a paragraph form. You're just doing bullet points. But it does need to be in your own words, or if you're citing someone, you need to, to, to clearly specify. So let me just go ahead and read here. So again, I just have the first, the first several steps. So the first step is observe it. And so you have spiritual preparation. I do want you to, to, to practice this. Uh, this might seem unnecessary, but I want to emphasize this component. So I have written out a prayer. And so I hope that each one of us, well, I shouldn't say hope, you're required to write out a prayer. So it shouldn't be too long. This will be the longest. Maybe it can be shorter. But I'll just read the prayer that I wrote out. Again, it's a prayer specifically geared towards your study. So, dear Heavenly Father, please forgive me my sins. I know that I fall short. I repent and commit to following your will and word. Please transform my heart and give me the passion to serve you faithfully, especially as I interpret your word. I ask now for wisdom and the filling of the Holy Spirit. May he guide me as I study your word. May he give me understanding so that I will be faithful to what you have said and that I might apply your word in my context faithfully and in agreement with what, with what you have spoken, especially in the text that I am preparing. As I prepare this work, may my desires, thoughts, and opinions be ever less, and may I exalt you and your Son. Finally, I ask that through my work, your gospel might be proclaimed, and your Son, Jesus Christ, might be magnified, exalted, and cherished. By the hearers, I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. So what I first want to emphasize is that um, you're writing your prayer out because I don't want you to just be repeating a prayer in, in vanity or re vain repetition, okay? Um, I, when I pray, I just pray, but my prayer is specifically geared towards giving me understanding to interpret and cleaning my heart from sin. Okay, so you, you, can, see, you can see here, so, so here you have this, this, uh, this cleansing part here. And then down here, you have the component asking for help with, with interpreting. Okay, so I don't want your prayers to be super long when you write it out, but I do want you to, to write in your own words a prayer asking for guidance from the Holy Spirit to interpret your text, okay? And in the future... I, you should always just pray. Just You don't have to write it out. Just pray in your own mind, but I want you to practice. I want you to practice that. And so you should pray the prayer before you interpret. And at the same time, I want to see what, what you said. Okay, but it doesn't have to be really long. I just maybe three or four sentences. I did a little bit longer, but it's just an example. Okay. And again, you don't have to do paragraph form if you're CT. You can just do, you can just do bullet point. Okay. And then you're going to choose the, the you're going to choose the passage of scripture. Just one simple sentence. Um, Romans 1, 16, 17 is the passage to be interpreted. Okay. And you can do again bullet point for the CT. All right. Now, location in the history of salvation history. So location in salvation history. Okay. I have several sentences. You could be a little less. What I want, your passage is in a specific location. And I want you not only to identify where you are in that location, but I want a brief explanation of the benefit or, or how your text relates. So 
Romans 1, 6, 6, Romans 1, 16 and 17 relate in some way to, to Christ's death, resurrection, and exaltation. So let, let me just read this so that you, you can, each passage is going to be different, okay? So you need to, you need to, to think about how it relates. Romans 1, 16 is written after the crucifixion, resurrection, exaltation, and enthronement of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul highlights this in Romans 1, 1 to 6. So if we have time, we'll go to Romans 1, 1 to 6 so you can see this. So as I work through here, just so everyone can be clear, I'm, I'm giving you what I wrote out, and then we're going to explore how I came up with this, okay? So I'm giving you right now the what, and then we're going to go into the how. Okay, so we're going to go into the details after this, but I want to, I want you to see first the what, so that at least if we run out of time, you can start working on it yourself. Okay, so the Apostle Paul highlights this in Romans 1, 1 to 6. More importantly, the epistle to the Romans is a primary book that reveals both details and the big picture of salvation history, specifically the person and work of Jesus Christ and the the plan of God in redemption. Romans 1, 16 to 17 is a primary text that's going to teach us about what has happened in salvation history. Okay, so when you're looking at the relationship to salvation history, this is post, post-cross, post-resurrection, post-ascension. And not only that, but, it, but it's different than like James or because James is just dealing with, with issues within the church. And it touches on salvation. You have discussions of faith in chapter two. Romans is like primary, okay? So, so if ever there was a text that deals with salvation history, Romans is the primary text, okay? And so I'm really highlighting that. So as I study Romans, I'm, I'm really thinking about that. I'm really thinking about that. This is really important because when we go to this, if, you, if your text is in the second portion of Romans, if it's in Romans chapter 12, if it's in Romans chapter 15, you still need to be aware of where it is in relationship to salvation history. And you need to be aware that it's not a secondary text. It's a primary text teaching us about that. So just finishing out here, this is accomplished through the explanation and exposition of the Old Testament scriptures, especially the prophetic writings. So I am really setting up. So Romans is so foundational for salvation history. It's after the cross, so it's going to be explaining. It's, it's speaking specifically about the gospel, so it's fundamental. And it's specifically speaking about the gospel in relationship to the prophetic writings. So we're going to see that. We're going to see that, if not tonight, next week, okay? So again, in, 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 in writing... Uh, in working through your text, Old Testament will be different than New Testament for sure. But I want you to list where your text is in relationship to salvation history. So if it's in the life of Christ, so I think someone picked Mark chapter 10. So you're, you would describe it as uh, in the life of Christ before, you know, just, just describe it. Describe it where it is in salvation history. You have an, you have an example here to follow, Okay. I don't want more than four sentences. So three to four sentences. If you're a CT, you can do bullet points. Okay, so bullet points are a little bit easier than doing a paragraph because you're just going to give a single sentence per, per bullet point. Okay. Any questions or comments? Uh, Pastor Tim? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the importance of having this uh, location in salvation history so that we can prepare a message, or uh, we can be pre uh, we can prepare an interpretation that, that is Christ centered. Exactly, exactly. So, for example, if this is pre-cross, if this is Old Testament, you need to also be thinking about: Is there going to be a type in my text that points towards Christ? If it's post-cross, you you don't need to be looking for types. It's post-cross. It's it's Christ is already ascended. Everyone's there, but. But, but you could be looking back to the Old Testament. So this is really orienting us. And it's also, as Pastor Henry says, it's preparing us so that we can, we're going to relate Christ in the gospel in some way. There's going to be a relationship in some way. And so this is really orienting us. Great, great, great job. And going back to study, study. So you could do paragraph or you can do bullet point, unless you're MAT. If you're MAT, then you need to be doing the, the paragraph form, okay? 
Okay, okay, sir. Yeah. Copy. And and we we uh our workshop from last week briefly talked about different ways to write a paragraph formation. So we'll have another workshop. But if you're a little bit stressed about how to write a paragraph, I would really recommend watching that video. It's how to it's it's writing workshop number one. It's on the the YouTube channel. I think I posted it on the group the group page. I would really recommend watching that video. It's like 55 minutes or something. That will be very helpful if you're go if you want to write a paragraph, okay? And there's more paragraphs to write. Um, there's a lot more than what we said, but it's a good start, okay? Okay, let's let's go on here. Okay, so that's so right now you've already you've already done. So there, we're going to be doing four of these for next week, okay? So one is the prayer that that should not be challenging at all. Just take your time in writing it out. Two is easy. You're just going to list the passage of scripture in a sentence. Three is a little more difficult. I want you to practice that, okay? Next is genre identification. So this might take some research. So you want to use your commentaries, but you want to identify the type of genre that you're interacting with, okay? So I have three sentences here. Um, I want at least three or four sentences, okay? And I will spell this out in the assignment when I post the assignment tomorrow. Um, Romans 1, 16 and 17 is located in the epistle to the Romans. So notice that's my topic sentence. This is my topic sentence here. This is my topic sentence and I'm identifying epistle, right? So Romans is located in the epistle to the Romans. The letter to the Romans is written in an epistolary genre. So there I'm identifying the genre. So in your genre identification, you need to identify the, the genre of your book, okay? And then I have one more sentence to explain. The primary genre is maintained throughout the letter and is also the subgenre of the text that will be investigated, okay? There'll be different genres. So for example, if your text, I think most of the texts are in, are in, um, are in epistles that were chosen. Someone chose Daniel, so that's in a prophetic, that's in a prophetic genre. Now there's debate, prophetic, apocalyptic. I'll allow some leeway there, but it's in a prophetic, it's in a prophetic visionary genre. It's different than this. Okay? So looking at a commentary, they will give you both the genre of the book and then also of the specific text that you're looking at. So just I'm shooting from the hip right now. I'm shooting from the hip, which means that it's not a, it's not an accurate, it's not a super accurate shot, but like, so if your text was in a vision of Daniel, you would say prophetic genre. It's a prophetic book. Daniel is a prophetic book. And the sub genre is vision. It could be visionary. Okay. So if it's, it's, if it's in visionary, if it's not, if it's in a discourse, so if it's Daniel speaking or Nebuchadnezzar speaking, if it's a song, if it's a prayer, those are different sub-genres, okay? If you have a question, send me an email. Uh, don't send me an email Tuesday. Send me an email. If you have a question working through this, send me an email later this week. You know, I'm here. This is what I think the genre is, um, and I can, I can send you a brief answer back, okay? But for, again, it's not a trick question. So I'm just looking for the genre of the book, and then your specific genre. So for example, gospels, gospels, you could say it's a narrative genre. I'm not going to be, it's debated. You could say it's a gospel genre because that's debated. Um, but then like it could be discourse or it could be parable. It could be, it could be a parable, right? So that's the subgenre. Parable is the subgenre. Okay. Um, any questions or comments or that's making sense? Dean? Yes. Uh, since most of us here are new in terms of all these kinds of terminologies, yeah. can you provide for us at least a list of example? What are the what are the kinds of genres available or yeah. found yeah. in the Bible? Yeah. So so I can provide the list. I'll put the list sometime this week. But the commentaries that you downloaded will talk about this. So this is where. You, uh, the, the commentaries will also talk about this, okay? But I will I will make a list of the of the genres. I will post that 
I will post that as well. But again, I don't want you to, to be to be overly stressed. For the most part, it's it's pretty straightforward. This is not. I I don't want I don't want you to overthink it. Just list. You know, if it's in if it's in Peter, uh, First Peter, whatever this is my text. It's listed in the epistle to, to Peter. You can even follow my pattern. <laughs> okay, in this example, not in other examples. Okay, but 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 you know. Again, just I just you can just do bullet point. Again, I, the the main points is I'm looking for the main genre of the book and then your genre, and the two are the same. So here, it's the same. It's epistolary genre, subgenre is the same. So it's it's it should be easy. Okay, here, <clears throat> this is a little this is a little more in depth. I, I I'm going to highlight the things that I have here. You can use bullet point. It should not be stressful. So background study, um, background study is um is uh let me just read through here and you can just do bullet points okay and um we'll work through this again next week so again don't don't be stressed just just i'm gonna highlight as we work through so that you can see that it's not so stressful okay a background study is helpful in assisting in the interpretation of romans 1 16 to 17. so this is just a topic sentence that introduces um what the set the, the paragraphs are about it's a, it's a background study okay so i'm just giving a topic sentence highlighting highlighting what is what is to follow okay if you notice here the apostle paul identifies himself as the author of this epistle so this is this is the first this is authorship here okay so i'm just identifying so you could just have a bullet point the author of James is James, right? Or the author of Peter is the apostle or the apostle Peter. Okay, so whoever the author is, the author of 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 my psalm is David. Okay, so again, you can easily find that in your commentary. So I don't want you to interact with anything more than just making a statement of who the author is. Okay, the letter is addressed explicitly to the saints in Rome. So here, this is the audience. Okay, so again, you can just do bullet point. You can just do bullet point, okay? Um, the church in Rome is composed predominantly of Gentiles. Okay, so now I'm identifying who the audience is, okay? It is preferable to date the epistle between 55 AD to AD 58. So here again, this is... This is the, the date, all right? So I'm just making a sentence, all right? And then I do have a proof here. I have one citation here, all right? I, again, I wanna take a step back. Right now, um, just to be clear, what one, wait, 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 one, two. Okay, so this, this is why there's a typo. This should be, this should be four, and this should be five. Okay, the assignment for next week is going to be cut off here. Okay, um, but I want to, I want to work through this because I want you to start, I want you to start practicing. Okay, so this will not be due until two weeks. All right. Tom Schreiner describes so, look, so looking here, Tom Schreiner describes dating ancient letters is notoriously difficult, but in the case of Romans, we can safely locate the letter between fifty-five and 58 AD. Paul informs uh, the Romans that he has finished with his missionary endeavors in the East and that he plans to visit Rome after completing his proposed visit in Jerusalem. So I just found one quotation describing why I chose the date that I chose. Okay, so this is just one proof. All right. So again, don't be stressed. You're going to see this Every commentary is going to give a date and give a reason why, okay? It's at the beginning. It will not be hard, okay? Uh, so I'm just, I'm giving the, the date. So I specify the date here and then just one reason, okay? Going on to the next paragraph, going on to the next paragraph. Paul explicitly, uh, Paul states explicitly the purpose of the writing of his letter. He desires to proclaim the gospel 
to the saints in Rome in order that he might have fruit among them as he does the rest of the Gentiles. So here, this is the purpose of Paul's letter. Okay? And it's from, it's found in Romans 1, 11 to 15. Again, uh, we're, we'll probably do a workshop either Saturday or next week. We'll, I'll show you where you can find these in the commentaries. I want you to at least try to be looking up this type of information as you study. But again, this is not due next week. I do want you to start to work on it, okay? Uh, now I'm I am making I'm I'm making some information I'm making some I'm, I'm providing some explanation here. You don't have to do this, although as you read, I think that you will want to explain, and this helps you um, as you think think through these things. Um, this is fundamental to the understanding of the letter. In this declaration, so the declaration that Paul wants to proclaim the gospel to the Romans and that he wants to have fruit among them, this is fundamental to the understanding of the letter. In this declaration, we see that the gospel is clearly not meant to be proclaimed only to unbelievers, but also to believers. Okay, so, so the gospel is not just, the proclamation is just not unbelievers, but also believers. More importantly, it must be recognized that the gospel is crucial towards the sanctification of the Christian, and that's seen in the fruit that he wants to, to have among saints in Rome, okay? And then here, I just have a brief concluding paragraph. There's more things that you can add. There's contextual issues. There's, there's other things that can be added. Again, this is just a basic example uh, here. This is a concluded, this is a concluding paragraph. In conclusion, this background study is quite beneficial for the investigation of Romans 1, 16 to 17. It is important because of the presence of the author, the mention of the gospel, the citation of Old Testament scripture, and the reference to salvation, both being offered to Jew and Gentile, among other things. This exegetical paper will include this background information in the investigation and explanation of Romans 1, 16 and 17. Okay, so again... Um, now, ideally, I wanted to work through all of these things before I gave you the conclusion, but we don't have time. And I do want you to start on this process because your assignment will be one, will be one to four. Okay. Um, so as you're, but as you're researching, I also want you to be thinking about <coughs> this background. Now, I do want to, maybe you're stressed. I do want to make one other statement here. Um, this is part of your final project. So everything you're doing now, it's both an assignment and also you'll resubmit it because I will give you comments and then you're just going to resubmit it as your final. So you're literally work, we're working together through the process. Okay. So uh, just to, to, to summarize what we're doing here, we will work through the background information next week. I'm going to help work through it. I do want you to start researching. So I want you to start reading commentaries. I want you to start gathering information. Your assignment for this week, which I'll post uh, early in the morning, is I want you to, I want you to write out a, 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 a prayer um, uh, following this pattern. I want you to, to do number two. I want you to do number three. And I want you to do number four. It's not that much information. Most commentaries you'll have within the first 20 to 30 pages, all, and they maybe even have a big thing, and they'll discuss the genre. They'll discuss the, uh, they'll discuss, uh, for sure, you can probably even identify, you can identify where it isn't with, with respect to location of salvation history. So um, I'll open it up to questions. Uh, don't shoot me. I, maybe you're stressed. I don't know. Um, go ahead and, and, and ask your questions. I will be the first. Go ahead, go boy. I chose Romans also 8, 37 to 39. Since you use Romans 1, 16 and 7, verse 17 to 16, 17 as example, do you want me to change? Because 
those those things you write, I may use it for myself. I will not yeah. have to change so, because that is the same introduction, yeah. the same, yeah. you know. No, okay, so this is where I really want us to see that each author is going to have a slightly different, is going to have a slightly different, okay? So I want you to do your own research and I want, yours is going to be slightly different than mine, okay? So in some ways it's going to be harder for you because I don't want you to copy mine. So those who chose Romans, it's actually harder because I want it to be different, all right? Because it should be different. It should have your own nuance, okay? So you should be able to write it in your own words, and I want to see you interacting with your own commentary. So, um, yeah, I, you, can keep, you can keep Romans, but I want, it to be, I want it to be different. Now, maybe you're saying, Tim, it's postmodern. No, <laughs> no it's, it's complementary. So, so, so because... To, Tell my God, even consider what I'm writing. I mean, it's like a commentary. It's like another commentary you can use. So I do want you to use your own, and I want you to come up with your own, um, your own wording, okay? Um, again, though, you're not doing the background study yet. I do want you to start researching. Yeah, it's going to be fine. Again, what, the work you put in now, your, your, your sermon, your, it's, it's for two. It's for two. So... Don't be stressed. And there's no other assignment. This is the assignment, except for the MAT, you'll have some reading to get to do. Uh, any other questions or comments? Uh, Tim? Yeah, go ahead. This is just for your confirmation or validation. Yeah. I'm using the Quiz Study Bible and the International Inductive Study Bible, which already yeah. give the background and all which you have. You have any concern about it? Yeah, so no, I so so I do not have a problem with you using study Bibles. I still want you to be interacting with commentary. So use the study Bible as a guide. So you can okay, I see this as maybe you know, so but I still want you to be interacting with commentaries as well. So I will allow you to use study Bibles to help in, in, in your understanding of the text. Absolutely. But I, but I do want you still to be interacting with commentaries as well from, from, from online, okay, Alex? So, so even in your writing, you can be using, but I, I want you to be using, to be researching as well. Meaning to say, Alex, uh, I don't want you just to be, oh, quiz study about, I got all this stuff. Okay, okay, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. No, 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 I still, you can use that as a check. You can use that as a help to guide you, to, you know, um, but, but I still want you to be using, just like everyone else, uh, using the online resources, okay? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Tim. Uh, You're, so welcome. Tim. You're welcome. Go ahead. Yes, uh, so Tim, um, uh, I just mentioned you uh, about my, uh, our, uh, you know, our own commentaries yeah. here available for us. So uh, I will be using, aside from John Calvin's commentary and uh, Paul Pet commentaries, using the Baker's exchange. And the last one is the NIV, uh, NIV exegetical commentary, Zenderban exegetical commentaries. So that, I think that that's the available. Yeah, that's um, good for, that what was the, what was the middle one? Yeah, those those sound fine. What was the other one? I, I missed what you said. All right, so the Baker exegetical commentary. Yeah, that's that's good. That's good. Yeah, you can use us. Yeah. yeah. And then um, the the new international commentaries. Yeah, that's, and the last one correct. is the. Yeah, and the last one is the uh, Zunderbund exegetical commentary. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. All right. But so, Sonny, Sonny, I still want I still sorry, I still want you to also pull some resources off. If you I know you're auditing, so it's not required, but I I do want you to be working with theology on the web and and, and CCL. So just you know, we're we're EBST, we're 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 teaching in the cloud. So I still want you to be interacting with some but but those other ones are good as well, yeah. Yeah, so, so I, I, I took John Calvin's commentary there and also the Alpet's commentary as you um, suggested and also the some journals from the web, the web which you... Okay, um, good, good, perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, you, sir. You're welcome. Anyone else want to add? Or I can't see everyone's faces, so I don't know what they're thinking. I don't know what you're thinking. <laughs> Maybe they're scared. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I want to emphasize this. I want to emphasize this. Don't don't be scared. Again, you can use bullet 
for most of the CT, you can use bullet points. So I'm writing this in, in, in a paragraph form. CT can write bullet point. And I want to emphasize also that really you're, you're only focused on you're researching two things, number three and number four. So you're just looking up genre of the book that you're studying, genre of the specific text. Uh, most of the time it's going to be the same. And then you're also looking at the location in salvation history. And, and those are things that you can research, but also they should be self-evident. So those are that's really the only assignment for next week. And, I, and I'll put more details tomorrow morning. I'll post more details. But these are really uh, one to four is really the assignment for next week. But I want, as you're starting to research, I want you to start thinking about the background study. So that's why I brought that up. That's why we're talking about it. Um, I do want you to be thinking about that. So what you can be doing, and we'll do the, the, the research workshop, is just looking up the specific facts, who the author is, who the audience is, uh, who the, uh, the date and location of, of the text, um, the purpose of the text. Those are things that are not, those are easy to look up. I think, um, yeah, I want us to start, you can even just start with the bullet point, identifying those things and writing the source where you find them. And then the following week, you'll, you'll have to prepare a background study. And again, this is, imagine this being like a rough draft for then your, which you're going to represent better down the line. Okay. So, um, yeah, most people spend all their time at the end of the semester rushing to write their paper and we're going to work through it slowly. And then you're going to resubmit better at the end. Okay. So I don't want you to be stressed. All right. Anyone else want to ask a question or make a comment? Uh, homework, just, just to review. Okay. The homework. All right. So again, the assignment number three, you're just doing steps one to four bullet point format for CT and then paragraph format for MAT, MATC. Okay. So really you're preparing, um, Really, you're researching two things um, for this first this first assignment in 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 your for your text. the The next thing is for the reading reflection report number three is uh, step number one observation. What do I see? And chapter number nine word studies. Okay, so those are those are two readings for the MAT MATC students. I will. Uh, post the reading. You should be able to find them on Google Books, but I'll also send out an email first thing tomorrow morning for all of us to read. Again, I don't want us to be stressed, all right? Uh, the, the one other thing that I want to emphasize is that just a little bit every day is better than is everything at the end, okay? So each day just try to do a little bit, do a little bit of practice a half an hour each day versus everything on Tuesday. And, and we're going to, again, work through the steps again in detail uh, next week. Okay. So I want you to try the assignment. You have a pattern to follow. I'll post that pattern as well um, on our, on the hermeneutics page as well. Okay. I'll post, I'll post that, that pattern as well. And then we'll, we'll work through the details and especially with the background study, going into a lot more of the details with the background study next week, okay? Pastor Tim? Yes, go ahead. Are we going to uh, make a reflection report on, a, it's separate, so it's like step, step one and also chapter nine? Just do one reflection report, but if you read chapter nine, there's a bonus there, okay? So just, so your reflection report could be anything in step one or chapter nine. But if you read chapter nine, that's a bonus. I'll give you extra credit, okay? Okay, sir. So just, I just want one reflection, just one reflection report, not two. Okay, is everyone, is everyone okay? You're, you're alive. You're alive. Um, this is an adjustment. I also want to say this too. Right now, I, I want to say this. No one, people have been turning some things on time. Some people have been late. Right now, I have not taken off any points for people being late. There's a learning adjustment. We're all adjusting. So um, I don't want anyone to view that as, oh, I'm going to take advantage of this. Okay. So I'm, I'm being very merciful. I want us 
the, the, the big purpose right now for my, from my perspective is for us to go slow um, and for us to, to be submitting good work, okay? So I'm not so concerned with stuff being turned on time, provided that we're working hard. I, I, um, I, you know, we need to be submitting stuff slowly. Um, there will be a cutoff day maybe in several weeks. I'll say, okay, moving forward, everything has to be on, turned on time. But for right now, I want you not to be stressed, okay? I want you to just stay, take your time. Just do one assignment at a time. If you need help, reach out to me. Um, watch the, the workshops on YouTube. Attend the workshop on Saturday if you can. Uh, we'll also record it, and it will be on YouTube if you can attend it. Reach out to me in an email or a text, a, a Facebook message if you need help. Um, so, you know, this is an adjustment at the same time you are, you are being pushed and you're learning so much. And I promise you, if you stick with it, this will be stressful. But I want us, I want us to take that step from just when we prepare a sermon, what do I know? Okay, I'm going to write it out and then I'm going to preach what I already know. I want us to, to move away from that type of method to where I need to preach a message. Okay, here's what I need to read. Here's what I need to study. Here's what I need to learn. Because... I'm telling you right now, when you can change that, it's a hard change. It's, it's a really hard change, but you can get to that place where you're researching your sermon. Your, the Lord will speak to you. This, your sermon level will go up. You will, I'm telling you, there could be a revival here. You saw it, the, the, the Protestant Reformation, they studied the word of God. And there was a massive revival. Jonathan Edwards, there was, there was a return to the study of the Word of God. There was the Great Awakening. And so, um, you know, our hope in the church is here. Uh, Paul tells Timothy that to guard the teaching, and in doing so, you will save yourself and your hearers. And, 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 and I, I want to say that our primary issue is not money. Our primary issue is not you know, multiplying and multiplication, or that's not our primary goal. That's, that is, that is sub, that is a part, but that's not primary. Our primary as leaders, as pastors, as, as mature Christians is ministry of the word and prayer, ministry of the word and prayer and, and everything else will follow. And then we have specific spiritual gifts and, and, and through those things, when God's word is proclaimed and, and we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, when the gospel is proclaimed, souls are saved, churches grow, churches are planted. And so it's not to say those other things aren't important, but fundamentally it's the proclamation, the study of the word and prayer. God speaking to us through the, his word, us speaking to God through prayer. Okay. And so I, I, I don't want us, I don't want you to be stressed. Uh, just take each day at a time. And if you're in a place where you're really stressed, reach out to me, reach out to Pastor Henry and say, hey, I need help. You know, can you help me? I need maybe special tutoring. Uh, we can work something out, okay? Um, but I do want you to be attending or watching the videos, watching all the, 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 the lectures, all the, all the videos online, okay? So just by way of review, um, we went through over the homework. We did not go over the reading yet. We'll do that next week. Um, we finished history of interpretation longer than expected, but I hope it was a, a huge encouragement to you. And um, we started the method. So this was very stressful when we started the method. And so, and so uh, um, let's continue the method. I will continue working through Romans. You, you can continue working through your passage. And um, I really hope that we can really um, progress and, and succeed here. So, Pastor Dean, Pastor yeah, yeah. Uh, can I make an announcement? Yeah, go ahead, make an announcement. Yeah. Okay, in sense, uh, uh, you will notice uh, classmates, you will notice uh, classmates, uh, mag classmate tayo, uh, classmate. <laughs> in, I have sent to you uh, in a Facebook about a new, uh, a new class we will start on next Wednesday at seven o'clock to nine o'clock. The, the 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 class subject is the the Bible's big story. So this will be 
a little bit easier, lighter. Yeah. What I mean, lighter, lighter in 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 what we are doing now in hermeneutics. This is more lighter, but it will help us understand the history, uh, the history of the inta of the Bible. So I encourage you to attend uh, next Wednesday. Uh, this will be for one semester until December. Every Wednesday at 7 to 9 p.m. Who is the teacher? So, who is the teacher? Ah, the man who is teaching now. So, wow, wow. wow, wow. You again. <laughs> Lord willing, next year or the following, Lord willing, next year we'll have some new teachers. So, Okay, let's let's close in prayer. And um, can I have uh, Alex? Can you close us in prayer, please? Most gracious and loving Father, you are the source of all wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. We pray that whatever we're learning here, it is always well guided by the Holy Spirit. I pray that we will not deviate from anything that we will not lean on our own understanding and interpretations, but solely on the leading of the Holy Spirit. So we need always your help, your guidance, Father, and allow us to come before you in true humility because you are holy and your word is holy and there's nothing that we can add. Also, we should not, uh, we should not permit anything from it. So I pray, Lord, that we will be faithful to you and we will be faithful to your word. And whatever will be achieved with this, all glory belongs to you. In Jesus' name.